Welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Todd Tragen, and I'm an assistant professor in the computer science department here at Rice University. I will be your moderator for this symposium today and joined by Dr. Angela Wilkins, executive director of the Ken Kennedy Institute here at Rice. First and foremost, it, it's an enormous honor to bring this event uh, to you today, uh, featuring a truly outstanding lineup of notable scientists spanning six areas of COVID-19 research and impact. Very briefly, I'd like to kick things off by providing some background uh, for, for organizing this event. There were three, three main goals that, that inspired us to bring this event together. Um, kind of part one of this was to reflect on the toll COVID-19 has taken on the global population since the start of the pandemic. The second, the second reason is to express gratitude to all the first responders, doctors, nurses, medical staff, and scientists across the globe who have worked tirelessly to minimize the impact of the deadly SARS-CoV-2 virus. And third, and, 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 and finally, to highlight optimism for the future with respect to scientific advancements that we've seen over the past two years and those that we will see in the near future. With that, I'd like to share my screen just to kind of give a, a highlight of the agenda we have for today before I hand it over to our speaker. So, I just wanted to highlight uh, the briefly highlight the agenda. Uh, all talks will be 30 minutes plus a 50 minute Q and A. Uh, kickoff is happening now. We will close at 2 p.m. Central Standard Time. And I just wanted to briefly highlight this this amazing panel of speakers we have today. Um, and I can't I can't wait to individually introduce them along with my co moderator, Dr. Angela Wilkins, today with for all of you. With that, I will stop this here and I will introduce today's first speaker. So our first speaker for this symposium is Dr. Peter Hotez. Dr. Hotez is the Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine and Professor of Pediatrics and Molecular Virology and Microbiology at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. He is also the co-director of the Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development. In addition, he is the university professor at Baylor University, Fellow in Disease and Poverty at the Wright University of James Baker Institute for Public Policy, Senior Fellow at the Scott Scowcroft Institute of International Affairs at Texas A&M, Faculty Fe Fellow at Hagler Institute for Advanced Studies at Texas A&M, and Health Policy Scholar at the Baylor Center for Medical Ethics and Health Policy. Dr. Hodes is an internationally recognized physician scientist in neglected tropical diseases and vaccine development. Dr. He has appeared on television numerous times over the past two years for which we're extremely appreciative, um, spanning um, all major media outlets, radio and newspaper interviews. Furthermore, Dr. Hodes has authored, uh, co authored uh, more than 600 papers and, and, and uh, has authored five single author books. Uh, I don't have time today to go through all of the, uh, the notable awards and achievements Dr. Hodes has, has, has achieved in his remarkable career, but I will highlight a few, a few of them. In 2021, uh, he was recognized by scientific leadership uh, awards from the AAMC Association of American uh, Medical Co uh, Colleges and the AMA American Medical Association, in addition to being recognized by the Anti-Defamation League with its annual Popkin Award for combating uh, anti-Semitism. Recently, uh, in 2022, Dr. Hodes and his colleague, Dr. Maria Elena Hotazi, were nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for their work to develop and distribute a low cost COVID-19 vaccine to people of, of the world uh, without pat patent limitation. Needless to say, we're very honored and appreciative of having some of Dr. Hodes' time today and wonderful to kick off this event with him. His talk is titled COVID-19 Vaccines, Science versus Anti-Science. So Dr. Hodes, a very, very warm welcome. The floor is yours and, and thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you so much. It's an honor to, uh see everybody again and to always enjoy keeping uh, my links with uh, Rice University and, and the computer science department and, and delighted to kick off this very important symposium. I'm going to uh, share my slides and all right. So, um, uh, just a word about who we are or who I am. So as was pointed out, uh, I'm a professor at Baylor College of Medicine, which is uh, in our Texas Medical Center right across the street 
from Rice University, and I do a lot of work with uh, Rice mostly through the Baker Institute for Public Policy, a lot of the policy aspects of, of COVID-19 work. And we uh, develop vaccines uh, for parasitic and tropical diseases, primarily diseases such as schistosomiasis, hookworm, Chagas disease, and leishmaniasis. And our approach is to work with vaccine producers in low and middle income countries in order to maximize the likelihood that they'll reach uh, those populations uh, in need. And that usually means older technologies. And the one that we focus primarily on is microbial fermentation and yeast, which was uh, which historically has been used to make the recombinant hepatitis B vaccine. So countries such as India, Bangladesh, Vietnam, China, Indonesia, Brazil, uh, Argentina all make their own recombinant hepatitis B vaccine. So it's a technology that you can kind of plug in uh, fairly uh, easily, and it has advantages. Then it tends to be low cost and. It's also a vegan technology. So no human cells or animal cells, human protein, animal protein. So it, it checks a lot of boxes for global health. And then about 10 years ago, we started developing coronavirus vaccines uh, for SARS and MERS using that same low cost uh, strategy. So that when the COVID-19 sequence hit, we were able to pivot it pretty quickly to develop a low cost and very effective recombinant uh, protein vaccine. We sometimes call our vaccines the anti-poverty vaccines because they're vaccines that have an impact not only reducing uh, uh, severe illness, but because many of our parasitic disease vaccines are targeting diseases like schistosomiasis, hookworm, Chagas disease, leishmaniasis, they tend to be debilitating and chronic and therefore actually trap populations in poverty. So we, this is actually an anti-poverty technology. And about 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, we coined this term, the anti-poverty vaccines. Uh, another S, and, and I've been writing about neglected tropical diseases for many years and have been involved in a lot of policy activities for providing access to essential medicine and vaccines. And this is now the third edition of the latest, the latest third edition of the first book I wrote called Forgotten People, Forgotten Diseases about these conditions. Well, with COVID-19, uh, here's where we're at. Um, you know, the actual numbers that we have are probably underestimated. Some say as many as 13 million people have lost their lives. Other recent uh, Institute for Health Metrics evaluations say maybe 18 million. It's just a, an extraordinarily loss, extraordinary loss of life with as many as 4 million deaths in India alone. And if you look at the US, we're fast approaching 1 million deaths by next month, 90,000 deaths here in Texas. But the bottom numbers in italics, I wanna, wanna call your attention to the extraordinary fact that 250,000 unvaccinated Americans and 25,000 unvaccinated Texans lost their lives well after vaccines became available last May to any, by, by May one last year. Uh, pretty much anyone who wanted to get vaccine had access to it, and yet so many people refused or were defiant of vaccines. And this is, you know, one of the unspoken about tragedies in COVID-19, people losing their lives through anti-science defiance and being victimized by anti-science rhetoric. And here's another way of showing this. This is Texas when we were at 80,000 deaths. Now we're at... Um, uh, 85,000. And you can see the deaths before COVID vaccines became widely available. And, you know, that is kind of understandable, although there were a lot of things that could have been done to prevent that loss of life. But here are the deaths in Texas after vaccines became available. So these two peaks were, were self-inflicted wounds or unforced errors that these were deaths from vaccine refusal or anti-science. And I'm going to speak more about that. So this is one of the true tragedies of our pandemic that most of these lives after May 1 did not need to be lost. The other thing we're learning about COVID-19, and these are new data that's been up for over a year on MedArchive, and I've been talking about it, it's finally got um, published uh, in Nature. It's the um, biobank study from the Oxford University Neurology Group. And what's impressive about it is, you know, they had 40,000 uh, MRIs of people through their national health system prior to the pandemic and those who got COVID, they could bring back to show before and after changes. So it's a very impressive study. And, you know, to me, it's 
the really worrisome part is the reduction in, in gray matter uh, thickness and reductions in global brain size and um, cognitive decline. And I think this is even once we're out of COVID-19, and, and I don't know that we are yet, we're going to be dealing with the consequences of long COVID in terms of neuro, neurologic, uh, in, neurologic impact and neuro, neurodevelopmental impact on kids, I think, for, for many, many uh, years. And we're still trying to understand the mechanisms of long COVID and gray matter brain degeneration. I think there's a lot of interest now looking at the um, autoimmune and immunologic mechanisms, including microglial activation and um, uh, autoantibodies and um, the role of cytokines. And, and there's gonna be a lot of research, I think that will allow us to spill over on more chronic persistent effects from infectious diseases like things like chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia as well. So we're going to learn a lot about long COVID. Uh, we are, you know, I think there's a lot of rhetoric out there still that says vaccines don't work. And we, and we have to remember they do, especially if you're boosted. So if you've been boosted and vaccinated and boosted, you still have a 23 times lower rate of hospitalization, even against infection. There's all this buzz out there that, Vaccines with the boost don't work against infection. They do, not as well as we'd like, but they still have a pretty big impact. And this is a, an important study coming from uh, the CDC. So we're, what's going to happen next? I think we, we still don't know. The Omicron, this Omicron wave is declining steeply. It's hitting a nadir, and that's exciting. I'm a little worried about this BA.2 variant, that subvariant that's out there in the UK and Denmark, and it's slowly going up in the US. Will that cause a, a, another wave this spring? I hope it does not, but I can't rule it out. What I am worried about are two things. One, you know, we, in the summer in Texas and the southern states, we saw big peaks in the summer of 2020 and then 2021 or from the original lineage and then Delta. So I have to believe we're still likely because we have failed to vaccinate the world. We still could see a new variant of concern this summer. Uh, coming in the southern states and in Texas, um, that's that's one possibility. So possibility number one is BA2 means we're still not done. The second possibility is a big wave from a totally unknown variant this summer um, coming in from the low and middle income countries, just like Delta did in in early part of last year, and then um, and then Omicron uh, later this year. I think we could be in for another variant of concern coming in the summer in the southern southern United States. And then Mark Lipsich's group put out a paper early on in the pandemic uh, suggesting that we might see regular winter waves based on his analysis of uh, upper respiratory coronaviruses, including these two, which were well known even before the pandemic, even before SARS and MERS, showing that they peak every winter in January, February. And I think that might be a, another realistic possibility. And all of this, you know, in terms of getting out of it still depends in my view on this, you know, trying to reach unvaccinated populations uh, in the world. And this is a bubble map showing where people are still not getting vaccinated. And it's overwhelmingly in, on the African continent, South and Southeast Asia and somewhat in Central America. And so the low and middle income countries, we've still done a poor job uh, vaccinating them. And I, you know, I think part of the problem was we never fully understood the scope of the problem. And that when you're talking about the doses of vaccine needed, you know, the Biden administration came out a few weeks ago and announced that the U.S. government has donated more doses than any other, 475 million doses, which is okay, but it, you know, it doesn't really get to the real part of the problem where you have a billion people in sub-Saharan Africa, 650 million people in Latin America, half a billion to a billion in the smaller low-income Asian countries, that's two to three billion people. That's six to nine billion doses of vaccines that we need. And I think we just never had that, you know, the policymakers never had that situational awareness. I think the COVAX sharing facility was a good idea, but it but there was an upstream science policy, policy failure in that we were so focused on what I sometimes in my frustration call the shiny new toys. I mean, mRNA, DNA, adenovirus, vectored vaccines, particle vaccines, that we didn't give thought to the fact that we 
that we needed vaccine produced in low and middle income countries at scale right away. And the the portfolio should have been balanced with something like a yeast-based recombinant protein subunit vaccine, um, which can be made locally in India, Indonesia, Bangladesh, uh, Vietnam, et cetera. So that's what we set out to do. We needed more matchbox cars, not only the shiny new toys. And, and the truth is the matchbox cars are looking like they're as, as good a vaccine. So it's, there's no, there's no um, loss in quality uh, because of it. So since that was our strength, developing our receptor binding, do, re- developing recombinant protein vaccines in yeast and for our SARS and MERS vaccine, we focused on the receptor binding domain of the SARS-2 coronavirus uh, shown here. And very straightforward approach is to uh, bind it onto aluminum hydroxide or alum and then add a CPG oligonucleotide. And our two favorite ones are a TLR9 agonist, a CPG oligonucleotide from the Dynavax Corporation, and also a 3M TLR7 uh, agonist. And we showed both vaccines are highly effective in non-human primates. They induce high levels of virus neutralizing antibodies in phase one through three trials low cost, ease of production for tech transfer, and then emergency use listing uh, uh, in multiple countries that we were in touch with. And so that's what we began this uh, technology during 2020 uh, and into 2021 technology transfer uh, of our vaccine. And we did this with no patent, uh, no, no strings attached, because we wanted to make it as straightforward and simple as possible to vaccinate the world, our own version of Texas-based vaccine diplomacy. And, and this went to India, Indonesia, Bangladesh, and, and Southern Africa. And we're still in discussions now with, with other countries, and it's moving forward quite nicely. The one that's furthest along is known as a Corby Vax. And so we you know write about these, uh, we put all of our vaccine development schemes in the, in the open, open source literature, so anybody can uh, read how we developed the vaccine, or you can even do it on your own if you wished. And then we transfer the technology uh, to um, to those manufacturers. In the case of India, it's with Biological E, one of the uh, vaccine producers that has nine WHO pre-qualified vaccines, and they said no strings attached, no patent. And they've now released this for emergency use uh, listing in uh, among adults at the end of last year and now 12 to 18 year olds, and now we're seeing reports it should be out soon for the five to uh, 11 year olds. So that that's moving along really nicely. And in Indonesia, they're making their own version, which because it's vegan, they're also making it as halal, uh, which is for Muslim majority countries. And then with, um, and in terms of virus neutralizing antibody, it looks um, as, as better than um, in terms of the adenovirus vectored vaccine, also good T cell responses holding up well against the variants uh, and, you know, checking a lot of the boxes you would like to see for, um, for this kind of uh, technology. And it looks as, you know, almost as good as the uh, mRNA um, uh, vaccines are, and, and maybe even holding up better in terms of durability of, of protection. Um, also now with um, the Botswana government, uh, the president of Botswana came to visit us last year and now in collaboration with Immunity Bio, headed by Patrick Sung Shung, we're looking at not scaling up production of this uh, in, in Botswana um, uh, at, a, at a production facility that's going to be uh, based in the, in the Kalahari Desert. So that, that's going to be exciting as well. And now we're also looking at a universal coronavirus version of our vaccine uh, we're we're going to going to look at combining this in a, as a polyvalent vaccine, uh, for, including Corb, Corbivax or or another related SARS two vaccine together with SARS one, and maybe one of the ancestral bat uh, COVID coronaviruses in order to see if we can get spillover to prevent uh, future variants. The other thing that uh, I'm working on personally is I'm heavily involved in going up against anti-vaccine, uh, anti-science groups. This is my latest book uh, called Preventing the Next Pandemic, Vaccine Diplomacy in the Time of Anti-Science. And a lot of it was written before the um, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, looking at some of the big picture uh, uh, 21st century drivers that are bringing back disease. A lot of them are 
social determinants such as poverty, war, political instability, urbanization, deforestation, and climate change, but typically climate change not acting alone, but in concert with those social determinants, and looking at anti-science as a major force. And, and um, I got involved with this um, going up against anti-vaccine groups for a couple of decades now, because I have four adult kids, including Rachel, who has autism and intellectual disabilities, and um, wrote a book a few years back called Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism, which made me um, one of the lead targets of anti-vaccine groups. So I thought I would just briefly end saying a little bit about what this uh, anti-vaccine ecosystem looks like and how it's changed over time. You know, it started out as version 1.0 with claims that vaccines cause autism, and we did a lot to debunk that. And then about 10 years ago, it became more of a political movement around health freedom or medical freedom. And now it's a full, fully globalized uh, anti-science empire. And I thought I would just briefly take you through 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0, and then finish up. So 1.0. Uh, asserted that vaccines cause autism, and it began with a, a paper that was retracted in The Lancet claiming that the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, uh, the MMR vaccine, had the ability to replicate in the colon of kids, and then somehow that led to autism. And um, ultimately, that paper was retracted for being false. But then this, we got into this series of, I don't know whether you want to call it whack-a-mole or moving the goalposts, where every time the scientific community would debunk a link with autism, something new would come up and then it, it switched over to thimerosal preservative that used to be in vaccine and then spacing vaccines too close together and then alumin vaccines. And it then even went into um, uh, other vaccines unrelated to autism. So they, they started working on the HPV vaccine for cervical cancer and other cancers claiming it caused infertility or autoimmunity with no basis for it. And, and if that sounds familiar for COVID-19 vaccines, that's where they got it from. They copy pasted it from the false assertion from HPV vaccine onto COVID-19 vaccines. And, and this is when I got involved with, you know, writing the book, Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's uh, Autism, to go into the details showing there's no link between vaccines and autism and how autism begins early on in fetal brain development. We even did whole exome sequencing on Rachel and my wife and I to identify um, one of the hundred autism genes that have been involved in neuronal communication. And this made me now a lead target. They began calling me the OG villain, which I had to look up the original gangster villain um, uh, for going up against the anti-vaccine groups. So I was you know, already starting to be labeled as an enemy of the people. And this is kind of a new wave in science now, not only targeting the science, but targeting the scientists themselves. And But it did have some effect of reducing, um, sort of taking some wind out of the sails of the groups alleging that vaccines caused autism. But then it took a twist that even I wouldn't have predicted, which is that by the early 2010, so many kids have been denied, denied access to their vaccines that um, an aut um, a, a measles epidemic broke out in Southern California, in Orange County, especially, and this caused the California legislature to shut down vaccine exemptions. And there was a rebound to that. And this is when the health freedom movement started in the 2010s. That basically said, you know, you can't tell us to do it, uh, what we want to do with our kids. And it, it took on a political dimension and started linking itself to extremist groups on the far right and even the Republican Tea Party. Now, this really accelerated in Texas, where we had more than 70,000 kids denied access to their vaccines. And anti-vaccine activities were particularly strong in the Austin area and up in North Texas. And this and around this concept of health freedom linked to the, the extremist elements of the Republican Party Political Action Committee formed uh, Texans for Vaccine Choice and, uh, and uh, anti-vaccine groups started getting PAC money and um, it was very much linked to, to the far right. And that thread is with us today around COVID-19. And this is what we're seeing at, at this time is this under this banner of health freedom, medical freedom, so many uh, people are, are choosing to not get vaccinated as part of an allegiance to this far-right extremism, and it's had a killing effect. So these, 
there's this phenomenon now which is being labeled red COVID and it's been coined by David Leonhardt of the New York Times, but it's based on data from Charles Gabba who follows this as well as the Pew Research Center, as well as the, um, the Kaiser Family Foundation, um, uh, New York Times, National Public Radio. It's basically shown when you look at the COVID death rate in that, in that big uh, Delta wave and now with the Omicron wave as well, it's almost all um, in um, conservative leaning counties and the redder the county in terms of representation by Republicans, um, the more, the higher the death rate. So um, this is clearly the deaths and the re vaccine refusals very much occurring along a partisan divide. And this is the hardest thing I think for scientists to talk about or for physicians to talk about because all of our training is that, you know, you're not supposed to talk about Republicans and Democrats and liberals and conservatives are supposed to be beyond that. But I don't know how else you talk about it other than to talk about it. And the reality is now that we have, you know, far right members of Congress who at the CPAC conference are calling vaccines political instruments of control or They'll say first they're going to vaccinate you, then they're going to take away your guns and your Bibles. And as ridiculous as that sounds to us, there's a whole segment of the country that actually believes it. Or, or you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene calling people who vaccinate you as medical brown shirts, using the Nazi paramilitary um, uh, metaphor. And then this is amplified at night with the Fox News anchors who are, you know, can you continuing to use anti-vaccine disinformation and attacking scientists like myself. And so it's created this very dark turn where the um, anti-vaccine, anti-science movement's been full on adopted by political extremism on the far right. And my point is, you know, people are entitled to their conservative views. I have no issue with that. But what I do have an issue with is don't take this one on because it's leading to too much loss of life in the country. And it's the hardest one to combat of all. So this has been uh, sort of a big uh, issue that we've been um, starting to, to take on. And now it's expanding into Western Europe. There are anti-vaccine rallies in Canada. We heard about the trucker strike and New York Times, BBC reports. It's been linked to QAnon and even neo-Nazi groups. And to make things even more complicated is um, now US and British intelligence report on Putin's role in in using this as a wedge issue to divide our country even further and, and filling our internet with Russian bots and trolls and spreading anti-vaccine disinformation as, as, a, as a wedge issue to destabilize our country. So that's where we're at. I've been writing and speaking about how we start taking this on and, and get through this very dark chapter in American political life so linked to the anti-vaccine movement. So I'll stop there and and I don't know how you want to work things, take yep. questions or whatever you, however yep. you'd like to do this. Thank you so much, Dr. Hutt. That was a really wonderful talk. And again, really appreciate your time here today. Um, we have a couple questions here. And so I'll just uh, read the first one off that we got uh, from, from the audience. And so the, the first question we have here uh, for you is, what do you think we need to do to improve participation in, uh, of scientists in combating anti-science uh, and anti-vaxxers? And the comment there is there are, there are formidable security risks nowadays uh, and can endanger conventional career development. Yeah, no, this is really tough. I think, you know, first of all, we have to make young scientists especially feel comfortable speaking out because, you know, what happens now with many university offices of communication or academic health centers is, you know, they basically send the message to young scientists, you know, don't, you know, don't, don't, don't do this uh, because we don't want to put the institution at risk. Or if you're going to speak out, whether it's on social media or writing op-eds or doing interviews, you do it at your own peril and, and don't screw it up. And, and that's very chilling, right? Because, you know, because eventually everyone does make mistakes and, and you need to know you have the institution behind you. So we have to get out of this old fashioned way of thinking, you know, when I was getting my MD and PhD in New York in the eighties, the message was, well, you're not supposed to engage the press directly or talk to the public. That was seen as a form of self-promotion or grandstanding. And all of those ideas around science communication were before something called the internet came along and now the world has changed. And we have a terrible vacuum now where scientists are, are silent. And, and we have the problem that the uh, National Academy of, of, 
medicine, engineering, and, and science are silent, more or less, in many of the scientific societies. And part of it is because the anti-science, anti-vaccine movement is along such a partisan divide, and these organizations are supposed to stay politically neutral. But in this case, staying politically neutral basically favors the oppressor, to, to paraphr paraphrase uh, Elie Wiesel. Uh, so how do we, you know, have that conversation and make young scientists feel comfortable? And by the way, give them the communication tools that they need, because there is a way to do this. And we don't provide science communication instruction in our graduate schools or our medical schools or postdoctoral training. And, and I think, you know, there's a, there are opportunities to do that, but it's not just providing that training. We've got to make the ecosystem more user-friendly for scientists to feel comfortable speaking in. Thanks so much. Um, there, there is a, um, there's a, some follow-up questions here. Um, so one, one is um, uh, it, early in the pandemic, many believe that testing, tracing, and isolating would be effective. Uh, should we assume that these are only temporary measures until a new vaccine is produced or, uh, or, or simply are we unable to implement them correctly? Well, you know, we had, I mean, in the U.S., there were a lot of stumbles, right? I mean, we had a lot of trouble getting diagnostic testing underway. The, it was led by the Centers for Disease Control. They, they just, it just got held up and never really got off the ground as, as well as we needed it to. Um, and we never got genomic sequencing underway is at the level we should. We never got good vaccine effectiveness studies out there quickly. We relied on the UK and Israel for vaccine effectiveness studies. And because they didn't have the J&J &J vaccine, people got the J&J &J vaccine or left sort of totally in the dark about when, when the need for a booster was. So there was a lot, there were a lot of failings in our own US public health system and, and communication as well. Um, and missteps around the, you know, the importance of, uh, if you remember early on about washing packages and things like that, which turned out not to be necessary and not enough attention to the likelihood that this was an aerosolized virus or could cause asymptomatic illness. So, but, you know, all of that was amplified by the, you know, anti-vaccine, anti-science groups that would exploit any weakness and pile on, which exacerbated all of this. So, you know, what we've learned is, um, you know, evidence, the importance of evidence-based science, but also trying to figure out a way to do something about the anti-science groups because it's caused so much damage. And it's more than an academic discussion. As I mentioned, this is causing massive loss of life, more so than uh, nuclear proliferation or global terrorism or, or cyber attacks. Anti-science is now a leading killer of young and middle-aged adults in the United States. Thank you. Um, so uh, one more question here. Um, how, how would you suggest a clinician approach a patient using anti-science talking points and rhetoric to not vaccinate? Well, you know, there are about a dozen around COVID-19 vaccines, there's about a dozen talking points that are out there that people use. And I've written about them in, in a paper in eClinical Medicine and, and then one in, in the Washington Post. And and they range from the seemingly plausible, you know, they say vaccines were rushed and, you know, how could they be legit when they were rushed like that? But again, I point out that we were developing coronavirus vaccines more than 10 years ago, all the way to the craziness, right? That there's implanting magnets in us and they're trying to trace our whereabouts when you've already got a cell phone for that purpose and, uh, and, and, and that sort of stuff. But I, I found more and more that even debunking the individual talking points is often not enough to encourage people to take the vaccine. It's it's this this allegiance to to the far right or to whatever that thing is that that causes people to be defiant. That to belong means not vaccinating. And how you break that? How you uncouple the anti science from uh, from from political extremism on the right? I think is one of the really tough challenges and been having some discussions with the Biden administration about creating maybe an ambassador's program for states like here in Texas and, and those sorts of things. But so far, the defiance is still very strong. Great. Um, if you have time, I, I think we can do one more question here. Um, uh, the question is, what was the rationale for developing an intramuscular vaccine versus an intranasal vaccine for COVID-19? Well, you know, the, the classic 
approach is to use parenteral vaccines, either subcutaneous or, or intramuscular. We don't have many intranasal vaccines because it's been very tough to stimulate really effective mucosal immunity in, in people as a commercially, uh, not to use the word commercial, but as a, as a vaccine that actually works in people. So we are, we do have a program now looking at mucosal delivery, not only intranasal, but also sublingual under the tongue and, and oral uh, delivery. And it's, it's, it's not, it's not easy. Um, we, so there, and we're collaborating with a company in Israel called MIGVAX that's also looking at uh, intranasal and other mucosal delivery mechanisms, but it's it's not as well advanced uh, as the intramuscular route, which has been sort of tried and true for decades. Great. Uh, thanks so much. I, I have one, uh, going back actually to the first question here, maybe just end on this, and, and you've already answered this, but just to emphasize, there's been a lot of questions uh, related to uh, how individual researchers and scientists can, can help in larger public efforts to reduce the spread of misinformation. So if they have any final comments on that, what, what we could do, what uh, measures, things that we can get involved with to, to help in this, this effort. Well, what I would, I mean, on, a, on an individual level, if you know, you're still in training uh, or you're at a university setting, you know, have a discussion with your university office of communication saying you'd like to be more out there in the public domain and see what kind of, um, playing field they can create for you to help you with that, whether it's in terms of op-eds. And I think, you know, what the worst thing you can, not the worst thing, but one thing you don't want to want to avoid is getting out there ahead of your skis and then your office of communications finds out about it after somebody lodges a complaint against you. And then you're always playing catch up. But by, you know, bringing them in early on, I think that's one way to do it. And the other is to, you know, talk to your, deans, uh, academic deans about building in programs of science communication into your doctoral training and postdoctoral training and see how, how they respond to that. Thank you so much. Um, that was really wonderful. I just uh, want to thank you again for your time, for an excellent talk, for, for the, the, the answers to all of those questions and, and appreciate everything you've done uh, for the last two years tirelessly. It's just been really a source of inspiration for me personally, as someone who's uh, gotten involved and in, 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 in shifted some of my research to COVID-19, uh, just knowing that here in Houston and, and more as a kind of a global resource, someone we can look up and, and, and kind of be inspired by all of your efforts. So thank you so much, Dr. Hodez. I really appreciate all of your time today and everything you've done. Oh, that's so kind. Thank you so much. I just saw Don Milton put up something about the AAAS and they have a, a media communications program and, and they do. And that's He's, he's absolutely right. And that's something to look into as well. But I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to talk to you. And thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, that was really a wonderful kickoff. I, I couldn't have uh, envisioned a better start to this uh, day. Um, and very excited now to hand it over to, uh, to, to Nick. Nick, can you please? Um, well, I guess we have a couple minutes here. Um, so just one thing I wanted to do, sorry, Nick, um, uh, with, with this one minute I have, um, I, I really wanted to share my screen very briefly to, to acknowledge all of the support I've had to put on this event. This is not me. This is a team of individuals behind the scenes. And I just want to really briefly kind of acknowledge everyone here that has played a role. Um, so, so I just wanted to, uh, the Ken Kennedy administrative staff, Michelle Atkinson and Mackenzie Lee, uh, just very appreciative for everything they've done to bring this event to everyone today. Um, in terms of moderators, my co-moderator, Angela Wilkins, executive director of the Ken Kennedy Institute. And I would also like to thank my lab members, uh, Nick Sapoval, Michael Newt, Kristen Curry, and, and Yinchi Liu for their help today. With that, I will hand it over to Nick. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Nick Stapoval. I'm a third year PhD student at Rice University in the Department of Computer Science. And today I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker, Dr. William Hinoj, who is an associate professor of epidemiology at Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health, as well as a co director for Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics. Um, Dr. Hinoj has made seminal contributions to the study of diverse pathogens, both bacteria and viruses and has special interest in understanding how evolution, uh, how evolution responds 
to interventions such as vaccination and, and antimicrobials. Uh, his research on the current pandemic has included modeling transmission in healthcare settings, as well as uh, impact of vaccination in the context of arising variants. Uh, his awards include Fleming Prize from the Microbiology Society, as well as a Young Investigator Award from American Society for Microbiology. He has published more than 200 scientific articles and book chapters, and is a regular contributor to popular media aiming to improve our understanding of SARS-CoV-2. With that, the virtual floor is yours, and looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Nick, for that very kind introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here, um, not least because I want to say that I've been admiring Todd's work for years. And so when he reached out and sort of said, when I got the will you be involved message, I was enthusiastic when I said yes. So I'm going to now share my screen and I'm going to assume that people are going to tell me if I have failed to share my screen, but I'm thinking that that should be it. Um, so the talk I title that I picked was The Evolving Epidemiology of SARS-CoV-2. And before I get into it, I should point out that I have, I'm a paid scientific advisor to Biobot Analytics, uh, which is one of the companies that does wastewater surveillance. Although I should point out, I'm not going to be talking about wastewater at all in this particular presentation. When I started thinking about evolution, it immediately struck me that there are actually multiple different meanings of that word. So if you look at the Merriam-Webster definition, there is the one that you might think that we'd be talking about, which is Darwin's theory of natural selection, descent with modification and all that. But there's also the way in which things just change over time. The second definition here, a process of change in a certain direction. And I'm gonna talk first of all about that, and in fact, I'm going to revisit some of the stuff you saw in the last presentation from Dr. Hotez in a little bit more detail. And then I'm going to move into, in the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk about some modeling that we did on how you expect the virus to respond to various different contexts of vaccination and which type of variant you would expect under different circumstances. I want to start also by recognizing and being completely straightforward about the fact that there have been many different stages to the pandemic in the United States and in the world. And so first of all, I'm gonna talk about the pre-vaccine stage because there were basically three pre-vaccine pandemic stages in the United States. Um, there is the initial surge in which the Northeast was hit hard and the rest of the country relatively so, not so, with the exception of perhaps of Louisiana and a few places there. And then there was what I always call the, the sunbelt surge, which happened over the summer um, from May to September. You can see here the counties that were hit hardest in that. And then in September, February, of course, the entire country was experiencing severe amounts of infection. All those parts of the US which had been previously spared, those little towns in the Midwest started to have their outbreaks. The Dakotas went from being among the lowest per capita mortalities to among the highest in a matter of a few weeks um, and months. And this was a period when you would hope that we had managed to get some hold on what was needed to be done. You just heard previously about test, trace and isolate. That's not something which is going to work in a condition where you already have enormous amounts of infection, if only because of the fact that while cases can increase exponentially, the numbers of contact traces do not increase exponentially. However, if cases are low, you can work hard to keep them there. Unfortunately, as I'm sure everyone's aware, that's not really what happened. You can see here the proportion of all of the deaths that occurred up to February of last year, which was nearly half a million um, in each of the regions. So you can see the Northeast very much front loaded towards the spring, while the Midwest, the South and West were very much over, were very much loaded towards the winter of last winter of 2020, 21. Now this has taken place in the context of extraordinary and persistent inequities in suffering. This is work that I did with a group of people, including Jarvis Chen, who is a phenomenal biased statistician, which was looking at age specific mortality rates by race ethnicity. Um, and what we're looking at here, these are the rate ratios. So this is in comparison for each of these groups 
to um, non-Hispanic white populations. And you can see here that each of these was overwhelmingly more likely to die from the pandemic in younger age groups. This is one of those stories which is buried in the data because people always say, oh, young people don't get COVID or it's not severe. Well, it's much less severe, that's true, but it doesn't mean that it's trivial. It doesn't mean that we can ignore it. And we still see large numbers dying um, because even if something's rare, if it happens to enough people, then the numbers start to add up. And these changes have been correlated with a whole bunch of things. The United States, I don't need to tell you, is an extremely diverse country. And these are just some of the impacts. We heard, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about it, about the different political lean. These are vote shares um, from the 2020 election, but also big changes in median household income. Um, again, I talked about race, ethnicity on the last slide, and crowding and population density. All of these things could plausibly have an impact on the uh, progress of the pandemic. And so what we were curious about in this was which of these were correlated with the deaths that happened, not this recent winter, but last winter. And you can see here, this is broken down by county and they're graded according to how stringent the interventions were. And let me start here by looking, by pointing out that each of these slides, each of these figures, has places which had quite strict state level interventions, not necessarily quote lockdowns, but stronger than the laissez faire uh, regulations that were in place in large parts of the country, or at least some parts of the country. You can see here that actually places with low population density had high per capita mortality. That's what I was saying about the Midwest. And you can see here too, again, household crowding with a similar, um, for similar reasons. But the political lean here is quite remarkable. And the one thing which I think is very striking is that this is the, this is based on counties. Um, and I want to point out that these are the areas with moderate interventions, very comparatively, you know, not very strong, not completely laissez fair, but where you might consider it to be optional. And you can see here this increase from the most democratic to the most Republican counties. Now, I do want to point out, as I've said here, correlation is not causation. Never forget that. However, I do think that we need to consider, when we're talking about the force of infection, we need to consider population exposure. We're familiar with this from the concept of indirect protection via vaccination. But similarly, your exposure is going to be determined by that of the activities which are taking place in your community. If, if your community is a friendlier place for the virus, if people are more COVID curious, then you are more likely to encounter the virus in your everyday business, no matter what you do. And you, once it gets enough opportunities, it will start to infect. And you can see this um, very much because we tried to, all of these things are, are entangled up with each other. So we also did a couple of multivariable regressions to ask which of these were most important in predicting the amounts of death over last winter, the winter before last, sorry, I should say. Um, again, these are the death rates over that period by different county. Um, and we used two methods, lasso regression and random forest. And the best predictor, unsurprisingly, was the nursing home population because older people are much more vulnerable to the worst consequences of COVID. But in second place from the random forest was the political lean in the 2020 election. And it came in third after obesity and the lasso regression. I want to point out, by the way, that these are very complicated questions and that there are other factors which are not accounted for in this, most notably, perhaps, the fact that before vaccination, it was reasonable to think that places that had already endured large amounts of infection were most likely to have significant population immunity, which would be helping to blunt the consequences of further transmission. But it still remains the case that as we were just hearing, there really, and as uh, David Linhart was saying at the Times recently, there really are differences between the different communities. And I'm afraid it gets even uh, worse than the slide which Dr. Hotez showed in the last talk. This is something that I added this morning it's breaking down the most recent waves, um, that's Delta and Omicron, by the vote share, but also by poverty. And I want you to note here, you can see that there was a lot more transmission of Delta in these areas, 
sorry, I don't know what that noise was, was reminding me of something, probably this. Um, you can see here that there was more transmission of Delta, but you can also see that over Omicron, places were pretty similarly affected. That's not surprising. Omicron is a very transmissible virus. But look here, these are the these are the death rates per 100,000 person years, which is accounting for um, which is accounting for things like per capita mortality, etc. Um, by county composite political lean and percent in poverty, you can see that it's overwhelmingly the death rate is concentrated in poor Republican counties. And I'm not going to break it down by region, but if you do, I, I have other slides that will do that. You can see that it's driven by poor counties in the South, um, places, yeah, like Texas. And this is a consequence of some of the issues we were just hearing about with the problems in getting vaccines to people who really, really need them. And everybody deserves protection, I should say, everybody. That should go without saying. Now, given those vaccines, a lot of the question in the press, which we hear about a lot is like, you know, we've got vaccines. If we've got vaccines, why is the virus still here? Well, the vaccines we currently have on offer give good protection against severe illness, but much, much, much less good against infection. And it, you know, if you go a few months out from even boosting, there's very little protection indeed. Many people remain unvaccinated. And again, I have to point out, it doesn't take very many people at risk to be infected for there to be a big impact. The thing you're looking at here is from a paper in JAMA, which came out last summer, and it's estimating from blood donors the proportions of each age group in the United States who had been infected and vaccinated by May of last year. Now, I want you to note here, this is the estimated infection-induced seroprevalence in the oldest age groups, the over 65s. So by May of last year, at which point around 600,000 people had died in the United States, only what? A little over 10% of the over 65s have been infected. Now that should tell you exactly how bad an attempt to gain population level immunity through infection would have been. But instead, we had vaccines. And a lot of people talk rightly about the number of deaths that have occurred. I don't want to, I don't want to put that aside at all. But we do also need to think about the number of lives that have been saved because there are a lot of people walking around today who would not have been if it weren't for vaccines and the work that a lot of people did to try and reduce the levels of infection in their community. Moving on, I'm now gonna talk briefly about Delta. And this is a GIF, which is illustrating the hospitalizations per 100,000 against the overall vaccination rate um, in each state or territory. Each dot is a state or territory. And you can observe this here is happening over last summer. That massive peak there, by the way, and coming up and coming down, that's Florida. The fact that it wasn't happening like that everywhere indicates the impact of the policies that were in place on the ground in Florida at that time. But you can see, too, the way that those places with better vaccination rates are not experiencing the same levels of hospitalization over last summer. And again, I mean, I know that this is a broken record and everybody listening to this likely knows this. The best thing to do in the face of this, and indeed for long-term handling this virus, is to ensure that people are protected. They have the best preparation their immune system can have before they eventually encounter the virus. And if we can do that, we can hopefully reduce its impact. And with that, I'm going to shift into the second part of this talk, and I'm going to move on to the thing which uh, is really, which is, I've spent a lot of time thinking about recently, which is variants. This is a rather attractive figure of the SARS-CoV-2 phylogeny, except represented as an actual tree rather than as a phylogenetic tree of sequences. The original trunk gave rise to alpha, omicron, delta, numerous others. One thing that a lot of people don't seem to realize is that um, it's not that alpha produced delta, which produced omicron, Alpha, um, which is now pretty much extinct, actually separated from the rest of the lineage around about the same time as Delta and Omicron before then. 
Omicron went off grid sometime around June 2020 um, and evolved for some time in a setting that we don't know. Could have been an animal population. Christian Anderson thinks so. I disagree. I think an immunocompromised individual is most likely. But then around February last year, split into the BA1 and BA2 lineages, which we are now seeing transmitting. So, but you can see it here also, there are many others. There's mu and there's epsilon, there's beta, which everybody was panicking about last year because it had substantial immune evasion. But the ones that were of global significance were alpha, delta, and omicron. Why them? What was it about them that helped them? And that was the purpose of the this paper that we published in Cell, possibly the most timely work that I ever hope to be involved with. Um, because I've been walking around saying to people that for an epidemiologist, transmissibility is scarier than immune escape, uh, because it means that you have the potential to infect people before you can vaccinate them. And I talked a lot about this with people, and eventually Mary, who is an excellent postdoc in my group, decided to see whether or not, in a, in a simple model, Bill was right. Now, the questions I wanted to ask were, do variants always reduce vaccination impact? And we can think of that in terms of the number of infections that are averted. Um, which type of variants would be most concerning in terms of number of infections and reducing vaccine impact? And I'm not going to talk about it because we don't have time, but I do urge you to read the paper. There's a lot more to it, um, in fact. How much does the impact of vaccination depend on the timing of the vaccine rollout? Um, as I say, I'm not going to talk about that, but I urge you to go look at the paper if you're curious. And for those of you who are not familiar with modeling, the next slide is going to look quite spooky. Um, but this is the model. Um, it's a compartmental model. The, it looks complicated, but it isn't really. All that happens is each of these is a compartment. These are like completely susceptible individuals. These are people who are infected with one or one variant or another. And over time, you set up a series of differential equations and all that determines them is, you know, the rate with which things come into the model and you subtract from that the rate with which, no, sorry, you put together the rate with which things enter a compartment and you subtract the rates with which things leave. And these here are just the things which determine each of the rates which are labeled there. And when we started doing this, our model was actually directed at something slightly different because we were wondering whether gamma was going to be a significant consequence. Uh, and you can, this, this started before Delta. And we have here four variants that we were going to compare. Variant zero was wild type, just a sort of null to check that there wasn't anything funny built in and we weren't favoring it. We weren't putting our thumb on the scale in any way. Variant one is the equivalent of alpha. It's more transmissible, but it has no immune escape. Variant two was the equivalent of beta. It is not more transmissible, but it does have immune escape. And variant three was a pessimistic uh, version of gamma, which actually turned out to be pretty similar to what, um, to what to the properties that Delta had. And I want to point out, this is not a realistic model in any way, shape or form. Um, any you know, any more so than uh, SimCity is a realistic model. It is instead an attempt to build intuition um, during the pandemic phase in particular of what types of variants are likely to be successful. And I always think this quote um, is a very, very good one when it comes to understanding whether or not models are going to be useful or not. So I'm going to, these are the results. I'm going to talk through them as and, you know, this takes a little bit of talking through, so please bear with me. These are epidemic curves on a log scale for in the absence of vaccination and in the presence of vaccination, vaccination occurring over this little gray bit here. And I want you to note that this is the, this is the null. Um, this is something which is exactly the same as wild type. It behaves as you'd expect. This is like alpha, it's more transmissible. You can see that because it rises very quickly, but it doesn't have any immune evasion, and so it drops at the same rate as the wild type. This has immune evasion. It increases at the same rate, or it increases pretty quickly, but it doesn't ever get very high 
And so even though with vaccination, it drops away more slowly, it doesn't it doesn't actually reach a high enough level in the population that it starts making a big difference. And this is Delta. This is both. This is transmissible and immune escape. And here you can see that there is a significantly larger amount of infections, even in the presence of vaccination. But the, uh, but the upshot of this is that you can see that moderate amounts of immune escape alone with no difference when it comes to vaccination, uh, when it comes to um, transmissibility, have very little impact during the pandemic phase. And in fact, if you look at the total number of infections that are reverted by vaccination, again, this is a log scale, so there are differences between these, but they're not large. It's much smaller when you're comparing variants with immune evasion than if you're looking at if you're looking at variants which have more transmissibility. And even though here you can see a smaller proportion of variant infections are reverted by vaccination, the vaccine still vaccines still do a good job. And the take home message of this is that in the pandemic phase, the key element is enhanced transmissibility. And this explains why beta was relatively unsuccessful. It caused a lot of disease in South Africa. It did relatively well in France, but did not go global. Similarly, alpha and delta, those who follow these things, and I'm exactly that type of nerd, will have noticed that Mutations associated with immune evasion cropped up again and again on those backgrounds, but they didn't do very well. And the reason is they weren't providing that much of an advantage in that context. And going back to the slide I showed earlier, by May 2021, roughly speaking, 20% of the US population um, had been previously infected. So the maximum possible increase in that context, leaving vaccines aside for the moment, would have been a 20% increase in fitness. And Delta was much, much more than that. But now we have this model and we published it in November, it's obviously that something you'd want to know, what do you do for Omicron? Because we can do that. So what we've done here is I want to be very clear, we have not modeled alpha, beta, we have we're not modeled anything here. We just assume two strains, Delta and Omicron. We assume that the vaccine has started to be rolled out before Delta. And we assume that vaccination coverage remains constant after Omicron emerges. Um, and what we're looking at here are, we, for a start, we want to disentangle immune evasion from transmissibility because both can make things transmit more. We wanna look at the impacts of vaccination coverage and also the role of the intensity of non-pharmaceutical interventions, NPIs, so-called lockdowns and controlling transmission in the context of Omicron. Now, this is the uptick of Omicron in Kaotang, and you can see these are each of the previous waves run out, um, left over each other, you know, superimposed, that's the word I'm looking for, on one another. And you can see the increase is phenomenally quick, but we can use that rate of increase, the um, effective reproductive number and the ratio between it to try and estimate how transmissible Omicron is relative to Delta. But unfortunately, we cannot quite distinguish this from the context which comes about from however much immunity there was in South Africa protecting against Omicron already. And you get different curves. So this, this is the amount of immune escape and this is intrinsic relative transmissibility. And you can see that with less immune escape, you need more transmissibility to explain the dynamics. And you can also see that you get different curves depending on what the prior population immunity was and from infection and vaccination. And I want to point out that here, you can see that these are the estimates that come from um, Jeff Shaman's group at Columbia. Um, and it's pretty much in keeping with now having been about a little over 60% of the South African population immune to infection with Omicron at the time. Um, anybody who wants to talk about differences in generation interval, which can generate that, we're looking at it now. Um, the work isn't far enough along to be shared, but I'm very happy to discuss it at some point later. I'm going to show you a couple of heat maps going forward, um, which are, these are the amount, the proportion vaccinated when Omicron was introduced. This is more immune escape, and anything in this direction means that it has to be more transmissible to, uh, to, um, to handle that. And we're assuming that the R naught of Delta is about six and that NPIs can reduce transmission and that there's this vaccine efficacy. 
versus delta. And what you see here, this is the difference between places which had previously had mild non-pharmaceutical interventions and been able to, as a result of that, had seen a number of previous infections. So there was substantial infection-induced immunity as well as vaccination. And here on the right, you can see those places which had previously held things in check with strong non-pharmaceutical interventions. And the strong non-pharmaceutical interventions have a big impact. You can see you get very few primary infections. These, these dotted lines are where we actually think the, uh, based on South Africa and, um, and the Columbia Group's work, this is what we think is actually happening in reality. You can see you get very few primary infections in places with mild non-pharmaceutical interventions, but you get a lot of them in places which have been using strong non-pharmaceutical interventions. And you get more and more of them, obviously, with fewer people being vaccinated. And as a result of this, you know, we did this work in early December, but it very much predicts um, exactly what is happening right now in Hong Kong, where there is a large amount of infection, there is an insufficiently large number of the older population vaccinated, a surprisingly low vaccination rate. Um, because of the fact that Omicron is so transmissible, the interventions are not equal to keeping control of it. And we're seeing a lot of death in that age group, in, the, um, in those older age groups right now. Overall, Hong Kong will have fewer, um, will have a less, a lower mortality than other places. But for a period of time during Omicron, I don't think it's going to be very nice at all. And I'm going to close with a few comments on what variants we, on, on why we, we hear a lot about variants. Um, this is a, from about a year ago. Um, where people were talking about scariants, because there was a point in time when everybody was looking for a variant and everybody was saying, oh, this is a new variant, variants here, variants there, variants everywhere. But not all variants are equal, as I said. And here's a canonical example. This is a, this here shows the rise over the summer of 2020 of this orange lineage across Europe. And for a period of time, this, this is a, work by the folks at Next Strain, was considered to be a risky variant. What actually happened, though, is that it was not due to the properties of the virus, but it was because of the fact that it happened to be especially common in Spain. People went on vacation to Spain, became infected, and then carried it back. And if you were the kind of person who was willing to go on vacation in a pandemic, you were probably willing to make all sorts of other contacts as well. And this is something of the inspiration for um, a model which I think is of wide applicability and uses a clever trick. Um, Bradford Taylor, um, again in my lab, has put this model together, which very simply models risk, differential risk in the population by asking what is the largest gathering that an individual is willing to attend. So if a person is willing to attend a gathering of say 10 people, they are disproportionately likely to go to gatherings of 10 people with other people willing to go to gatherings of 10 people. And that is what you would call a high value network for the virus. And you can put a standard SIR model on top of this, and you can use it to show the staggering, the, the result of is a sort of staggering of the epidemics. And I'm just going to have a quick look at what's in the chat. Ah, yes. Answer questions, um, and you can you get these this staggering, as I say, of the uh, epidemic curve, and this is the over. This is just for very simple illustrative purposes. This is where you have people only gathering in uh, gatherings of uh, meeting one other person, meeting two other people, and three other people, and then two other people, three other people, four other people. This is the, you can get the overall epidemic curve, but then within each one, you can see the, those that are, you know, that are more risk averse are those, I'm sorry, I'm talking about this badly. This is the people who are more risk averse. They are infected later than those who are less risk averse. And overall, you get an epidemic curve that looks like this. 
It becomes even more evident when you look at it with a larger number of risk categories. These are the people who are infected first. They meet in the largest groups, then these, and then these. And this might sound like it's a bit of a um, kind of pointy-headed um, exercise, but it's actually a quite neat way of modeling the fact that humans mix in non-random ways. And the apparent success of a novel mutation depends on the contact network in which it arises. So we should be very cautious about using up the Greek alphabet too quickly. It also explains some things we've seen recently about when the virus reaches older host networks. This comes from South Africa, and you can see that the, the earliest host networks to be infected were those who are in the 20, 29, and then 30, 40, 50, 60, et cetera. And the under, actually the under 10s are among the last to be infected. And I'm happy to talk in questions afterwards about why that might be. But you see it too, if you compare the Omicron case surges of cases and deaths. This is the Omicron surge of cases. And you can see that the deaths have been smeared out over a much, much longer period, all the way from here to here. And you know they're still going on. We're still having relatively high daily um, death counts in the United States, even though we are, you know, nearly two months past the peak of the first Omicron, of, sorry, of the Omicron wave. So to summarize, the pandemic continues to evolve in both senses. I think that it's very important to focus on reducing inequities in terms of vaccine access. A lot of people who are, um, a lot of poor folks in the US might be interested in getting a vaccine, but struggle to access it. And we should be doing more to help them. While the properties of future variants are unpredictable, I do think that the accumulated immunity in the population is expected to help and, pre and help prevent very severe illness in large numbers. And in the pandemic phase, transmissibility is more important than immune escape. And Omicron looks like it's shown that again, it's still the case. Now, mixing patterns also mean that the virus moves through populations at different rates and can explain lags between case counts and severe outcomes. And I'm gonna take a couple of questions after this. Um, this is my acknowledgement slide. Uh, these are, this is my group down to here. Um, these are other collaborators. Um, and I want to thank all these folks for, fun for funding. And I would like to thank all of you guys for listening. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, really fabulous talk. Uh... Hanaj, I, you know, I obviously and, and appreciate uh, just covering, you know, you know, so 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 nicely all those topics. We have a, we have a lot of questions to get through, so I'll just jump right in. Um, and and again, thank you, thanks again for the for the great talk. So one one question I'll just kick things off with uh, is is a two part question here. The first part of the question is many, many large corporations are ordering employees back to the office, exactly as mask orders are lifting, even in San Francisco. Large companies are reopening offices with no vaccine requirement, no mask rules, no indoor air quality standards. And then the question is, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts. Um, but the, I mean, it, it's an opportunity to, um, to try and communicate something about public health and the way that we handle these things. Um, people often say, what, sh what should I do? And my answer is, well, what do you want to achieve? What, what do you want to achieve? I mean... I would hope that the loss of, it's gonna be over a million Americans, would encourage people towards thinking that perhaps regulating air quality would be a good thing to do, you know? Um, I, I, I believe that there's likely to be other discussion of this in subsequent talks, but you know, a hundred years ago or so, we thought about improving the quality of the water that we drink so that you wouldn't get waterborne disease. Well, we can do the same thing with ventilation in order to improve things. Um, as, as if we do not do those things, then we expect there will be more infections. Crucially, those infections are not going to be as consequential as they would have been, but they won't be without consequence. And I think that, you know, we have to be straightforward about that. Um, people ask me what endemic means all the time. And my latest definition of endemic is it'll be endemic when people stop asking me what endemic is. Um, and this endemic doesn't mean little disease. It just means relatively stable disease. And how much of that do you want? That's a question which is not a scientific question. It's a question of values. Um, if we can figure out those values, then science can help figure out how to get there. So rather than saying, follow the science, we should be saying, where is it? Where do we want to go with it? Great. 
Great, thanks. And actually you, you responded to both parts of the question in that response. Um, so we'll go on to the next one. Uh, the next question is, could you please talk about the relevance of gathering size uh, model for people attending events with thousands of at attendees, such as sporting events and concerts and background infection rates, et cetera. So just, I guess, some, some insight further into uh, yes. expected. Okay, so go ahead. Certainly, that, there's a lot of, there are a lot of interesting things here. One of the things I didn't talk about is, a, uh, is the impact of overdispersion, even though it's one of my favorite topics. Overdispersion means that something transmits in clusters. The great majority of SARS-CoV-2 infections, you'll be surprised to hear, don't transmit. But those that do more than make up for it because they tend to transmit in clusters. And as gathering sizes increase, it, it's non-linear. It's as a, because, you know, like I said, Todd, um, I was talking about groups of 10 people. If your group gets larger, the probability that one of them is infectious increases, but so does the total number of people to whom the virus can transmit. So you, both of those increase the impact of gathering size on um, transmission. Now, when it comes to, it's also worth pointing out that once you end up with situations like very large gatherings, like concerts and so on and so forth, um, the total amount of transmission, actually, here's the best example. As you can probably see from over my shoulder, um, I'm a fan of the of Arsenal Football Club in North London. So we were talking about, um, I was talking with a friend at the start about, you know, stopping games and stopping fans coming to games. And they were pointing out, oh, well, look, the number of transmission events that will happen in the pubs is far larger than the number of transmission events that will happen at the game. And overall, that's correct. It wasn't a good argument, though, in early 2020, because you needed far more than just hitting one part of society in order to get effective control of the virus at that stage. So moving forward, yes, there will be opportunities for super spreading events at those things. The total number of infections that will result from them, however, is likely to be um, small in comparison to the number of transmission events that happen in private gatherings. Thanks so much. We'll just jump right to the next question and try to get through a couple more here. Um, so there's a question, uh, and the question is um, the amount of immune evasion uh, in these equations is the question, but I'm it's referring to some of the earlier equations they had presented, uh, has no relation to uh, change residues in the virus. I is this correct? And if so, is there any way to relate these two things, change residues uh, in the RBD of spike? For um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm among those people who thinks that the focus on spike is a little mistaken. Um, because it's very interesting. If you look at other uh, interactions of viruses with vaccines, you often see things that are not immune evasion being selected. Um, and so, for instance, I think that um, you can have, I don't think it really matters for the equations that we're using here because it's, it's a functional property as opposed to um, something which is explicitly modeling changes in spike. But a lot of the difference, the advantage that Delta had, for instance, was not so much immune evasion by changing spike as being able to replicate very quickly. And it looks as if Omicron may have similar properties as well as changes in spike. But I think that changes in the receptor binding domain of spike are interesting and worthy of study, but we should be prepared to look beyond them because there's a lot more to the virus than spike. And I think that sometimes we focus on immune evasion of that kind because it's relatively easy to measure with um, you know, looking at neutralizing antibodies, but there's much more to the virus than spike. Great, thanks. Um, one more question here. Uh, the question is, in, in regards to how human behavior models, uh, transmissibility, fitness for the virus, what metrics can be predictable? What can we do? Uh, what can we do so for the basic molecular features of the virus, but and, and, and what did you notice for humans? So really the question is uh, the interaction between human behavioral models uh, and, and with respect to fitness for, for the virus and, and what, what, what are things that are predictable, what things are kind of more, less predictable, I guess, in, in trying to figure out the dynamics of uh, disease transmission. Well, Todd, do you, know, do, you know the, do you know the roots, the etymology of the word epidemiology, epidemos, mm. on the people? Mm. It's on the people. Um, you know, we can... I mean, it's, I'll be honest, viruses are a lot easier 
the people. Um, the one of the things which is extremely challenging in uh, thinking what's going to happen, and it's also one of the reasons why CDC has and other modeling groups have been very reluctant to provide anything resembling a forecast more than a few weeks, is that it's so difficult to understand what humans do. And when humans change their behavior, it alters the opportunities that the virus has for transmission. Um, I don't think that any of the I don't think that the properties of the variants have been driven by changes in human behavior, but I'm absolutely sure that the dynamics that we actually see in reality, that, you know, the, for instance, the large number of hospitalizations in Florida is a consequence of human behavior in combination with low vaccination rates. Um, but I'm not, I don't think it has had much influence on the evolution of the virus. Uh, there are sometimes you'll get people making the argument that, you know, viruses don't want to cause disease because they don't transmit. And that's not really true. And you can see that alpha was more dangerous than the than the OG virus. Um, and de delta was more so than alpha. Omicron is less so. Um, it can go either way. And I think that, you know, it, people should remember that. And remember, too, that it's on the people. And people are harder than viruses. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Uh, a wonderful talk. Thank you so much for the detailed answers to all those questions. And I really appreciate your time today and, and attending this event. So thank, th thanks a ton. Thanks so much. And I hope to see you in person at some point in the yeah. next. That'd be, that'd be awesome. Great. Okay. We'll, we'll go ahead and transition off to our next speaker. And uh, this is our next speaker, uh, Dr. Don Milton. This is a, a enormous privilege for me to introduce uh, Dr. Milton. I had the unique privilege of collaborating and working closely with him while I was a uh, research scientist at the University of Maryland and continuing that collaboration when I transitioned my research group and established it at Rice University. So just an enormous privilege to, to introduce him here today. And, and, and so for some background here, Dr. Milton, is a professor of environmental health at the University of Maryland School of Public Health with a secondary appointment in the University of Maryland uh, School of Medicine's Department of Medicine. Uh, he is an in internationally recognized expert on aerobiology of respiratory viruses. Dr. Milton developed the concept of using indoor CO2 to directly measure rebreathed air and airborne infection risk. He is the principal investigator of the UMD Stop COVID study, which is investigating SARS-CoV-2 transmission and of the newly NIH-funded Evaluating Modes of Transmission study, a five-year, $15 million UMD, UMD uh, collaboration to perform randomized control trials that will define the modes and mechanisms of influenza transmission. And, and Dr. Milton graduated from University of Maryland, Baltimore County with a Bachelor of Arts in Chemistry in 1976, and obtained his Doctor of Medicine from this Johns Hopkins University in 1980, went on then to obtain his Master of Occupational Health and Doctor of Public Health from the Harvard School of Public Health in 1985 and 1989, respectively. In addition to all of that, and again, that's, um, you know, just for brevity, I, some highlighting some things I, I could go on much, much longer. Um, just, just his expertise couldn't have been more relevant to helping us get through uh, the last two years with respect to viral transmission and understanding the aerobiology. So, Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Milton uh, in this talk titled Airborne Transmission and the Future of Non-Pharmaceutical Interventions. Don, please please take it away and, and thanks again for, jo for joining us here today. Thank you so much, Todd. Uh, it was uh, it's quite an honor to uh, follow these amazing talks uh, by uh, the, the two previous speakers, um, uh, Peter and Bill, have uh, made amazing contributions to uh, our understanding of this pandemic and, uh, and, and raised a lot of really important issues. Um, transmissibility is what uh, I've been focusing on in terms of what's the role of aerosols. And what I'm going to do today is, um, given that this is a two-year anniversary uh, and a little bit like in the vein of the last talk is to talk about some of the history of how we got to where we are, and then think about where do we go next? And what are non-pharmaceutical interventions <clears throat> that can take us beyond simply doing lockdowns? How do we do them better and more effectively? So um, 
We had some early warnings. Um, on the left is a tweet from my colleague um, and, and longtime collaborator, uh, Matt Freeman at the University of Maryland in Baltimore, uh, a coronavirus expert for many years, um, posted December 31st, 2019, was the ProMed announcement came out. We knew that coronaviruses could be airborne based on the transmitted, based on the Amoy Gardens outbreak, where uh, what was probably a soil stack uh, and um, <clears throat> plumbing related huge uh, plume of virus was generated in one building of a large comp uh, apartment complex in, in Hong Kong and spread amongst the buildings. And uh, computational fluid dynamic models uh, of both the flow between buildings and compartmental models of airflow within the building matched where the virus went in that population. And at the time that uh, this was first observed, as the epidemic was happening, people were focusing on was it elevator buttons? Did you know? Was it contact? Was it uh, how was this being transmitted? But it later became clear that this outbreak, for sure, was by airborne transmission. And some lessons were learned, and some countries took those lessons to heart and very early on implemented non-pharmaceutical controls uh, and, and in Taiwan have been able to get to the next normal that we are still striving to get to. And it has made a huge difference in terms of the uh, uh, excess death rates compared to uh, the previous years with Taiwan remaining below the rates expected South Korea running around that rate. They're now experiencing Omicron having trouble getting control of it. And the United States where we've never succeeded in having control. And one can go into a lot of, of uh, aspects of how these countries are very different and social cohesion and, and politics play roles. Um, but let's talk first about how it's transmitted. And for me, one of the things that really jumped out at me early on was this family cluster of pneumonia uh, published in The Lancet in late January of 2020. It was clearly transmission within a family uh, to people who had not been to Wuhan from people who had been to Wuhan but had not been to the market. Uh, and one of the critical things to me was this crown class opacity in the older family members, but also even here in the lung of a 10 year old asymptomatic person who was infected. When I looked at that, I thought about, well, where is this? And I checked with my pulmonary radiologic colleagues and indeed the ground glass appearance is uh, suggestive of a pneumonia, especially in small airways. Um, and uh, we know that the small airways, we've known this now for a long time, for over a decade or two, that the small airways are not held open by cartilage and they can collapse. And when they collapse, there's a fluid film that forms as they reopen and droplets, tiny, droplets that become what are traditionally called droplet nuclei as they are exhaled are generated and exhaled with the next breath. If these small airways are where infection is happening, we know that aerosols can be generated from them. And we know from uh, studies uh, also done in Lydia Marlasco's lab uh, that these small particles 
which stay suspended in the air for a long time, are generated from these film bursts deep in the airways. And that larger, somewhat larger particles are generated by vibration of our vocal cords. And then oral speech movements can generate large droplets. But these droplets don't just expose people within a few feet. They can travel a long distance. Uh, a five micron particle at the typical indoor air velocities when windows are closed uh, can go as much as 100 meters before it would settle out of the air. If you have high velocity because you have fans going, you could go 400 meters. And even much larger particles as big as 30 microns can travel quite a distance. So some of us in this community that study this, myself, Lindsay Marr and others, were quite concerned and began posting in January about this problem that we need to be thinking about aerosol transmission, not just droplets, not just washing your groceries, washing your hands and staying back six feet. And we then had the evidence that transmission could happen from somebody who didn't have symptoms yet. There was debate about whether this first person who brought it into Germany uh, was symptomatic or not at, while she was at the meetings but it was clear that patient one was not symptomatic till much later and yet transmitted it several days before becoming symptomatic. Then we had reports of a restaurant in Guangzhou where people in this part of the room became infected and there was debate about could this be large droplet spray or was this aerosol? which then begins to get into this question of, well, why were people saying things that are bigger than five microns are not aerosols? They're floating in air, they're traveling many meters. Why isn't that an aerosol? It is an aerosol. It's not droplet spray. It's not something that you can avoid by being down range of a ballistic droplet. And a later, Hugo Lee's group at Hong Kong University showed that the air circulation patterns in these rooms were such that the high exposure to aerosols was in this part of the room because there was no exhaust ventilation at that time. We then began getting data on the size distribution of RNA that was of, from the virus in the air in hospitals and looking at a staff office, looking, and you can see that there's quite a bit, even in submicron particles here in the air where people are donning and doffing equipment. Uh, Sam Darpa and his group at Nebraska, studying one of the first cases in the US, found that they could also pick it up in the air including in personal air samples of worn by staff were the most likely to have it and have the highest concentrations. Why? Because they're getting moving around and getting into the exposure zones. Uh, then this paper from Singapore using a sampler developed by the US National Institute for Occupational Safety and ha Health, the NIOSH Biosampler, uh, sampling at different heights on both sides of a bed in an isolation unit with 12 air changes an hour. We're still able to detect it and find it both in four micron and larger aerosol particles and in smaller. But this sampler doesn't let things in that aren't aerosols, that aren't floating in the air. We then got reports about transmission on a bus with an explosive one case infecting people all over the bus uh, and uh, people riding to the same event both ways 
in a separate bus did not become infected. Airborne spread seemed likely. In March, we have the infamous outbreak at the Skagit Choir, where they were one of many choirs still practicing at that time, but they propped the doors open so people wouldn't have to touch the door handles. They used uh, various other droplet precautions, including setting their chairs farther apart. And yet they had an explosive outbreak and deaths. And while this was occurring in March, the WHO was denying that airborne transmission was important. Why? Because of an old adage that, well, you don't want to scare people. What we need to be doing is empowering people with information. Then John Lednecki in Florida, using a new sampler developed by Aerosol Dynamics in Berkeley, um, with uh, two samplers in a room, was able to pick up a uh, virus and not just detect the RNA, but to grow the virus. And there's been criticism in some quarters of saying, well, he, they just showed this uh, cytopathic effect, but it could have been something else. But in fact, they did the right thing. They also measured four, seven, and 10 days post-infection of the culture, the RNA copy number in the culture, and indeed showed that they were having cultures that initially had nothing detectable in the supernatant, where it became detectable and the copy number increased and the CT value decreased. Further reports of restaurant transmission uh, with uh, transmission at about 21 feet across the restaurant uh, following what appears to be the airflow direction. And uh, airborne transmission in a church where the singer in the choir loft who was the only person in the choir loft infected all of these people down below uh, and across a large auditorium. So in August, um, Kim Brather and I met with the leadership of uh, NIAID to talk about this. We talked about how using breath measurements for influenza, we had shown that masks were very effective. Uh, we reviewed again this paper from Nature Communication, Nature Medicine, uh, published in early April and having been cited previously to, by uh, the National Academies in a letter to the White House showing that for seasonal coronaviruses, masks appeared to be very effective. And talk about the difference between ballistic drops and aerosols of various sizes and where they deposit in the lung. Using the Gesundheit machine device that I have showed here on this previous slide that we had used with flu, uh, a group in Singapore uh, used it to study in SARS-CoV-2. I'm sorry, getting ahead of myself. This is another critical piece of evidence about aerosol transmission from Michael Klompas and the group at Brigham and Women's Hospital showing that they had sequence confirmed transmission despite the use of masks and eye protection to healthcare workers from patients or from another healthcare worker. And sometimes the index case was not masks, sometimes they were. The healthcare workers were using masks, surgical masks and eye protection and yet became infected. This is similar to the, the what was the wake up call for Japan where they realized that a large number of well-trained infection control people who went on to the Diamond Princess and knew what they were doing. They knew how to wash their hands and how to wear their surgical masks and face shields. And yet they also became infected that this has to be an airborne transmitted infection. So using the Gesundheit 2 in Singapore, uh, Kristen Coleman and Tom Kwok Wai uh, showed that breathing, you could produce, uh, you could detect virus 
um, talking and singing and that um, there is a larger fraction of the virus in the fine aerosol fraction than in the coarse fraction. We then, using the Gesundheit to here in Maryland, also studied about 60 COVID cases. And what we found was, was that about 20% were shedding detectable viral aerosols. But when alpha arrived, just about everybody was detect everybody that we studied was shedding detectable virus and the amounts of aerosol were increasing, suggesting that the virus was evolving to become more efficient at generating aerosols. And we were able to culture virus from the breath of some of these patients showing that it wasn't just RNA we're detecting, but it's actually infectious virus. So why has it been so hard to understand this? Um, that's why back in 2004, along accompanying the Amoy Gardens paper, Chad Roy and I described the aerobiological pathway of airborne transmission as the elusive pathway. Unlike filtering a glass of water and finding a salmonella or cholera bacillus in there, it's very hard to collect and detect pathogens in air. We only drink a few liters of water a day. We breathe cubic meters of air every day. And you only need one infectious dose in that large volume. The size of those particles depends on how they're generated. It changes dynamically in the air and there's physical decay as they fall out, there's biological decay, as the virus or bacteria becomes non-infectious and where it deposits in the respiratory tract depends on its size as it enters. It, larger things end up in the nose, smaller things get deep into the lung. And this is part of where the misconception about five microns as a cutoff comes from, because that came from early studies showing that to infect someone or an animal with TB required particles less than five microns because larger particles were not able to effectively get deep into the lung. And this is a key photograph from Wells's uh, textbook published in 1955, showing that rabbits exposed to TB in particle sizes, aerosols, but not droplet spray, aerosols greater than five microns did not become infected with TB, whereas those exposed to smaller particles did. The medical community misunderstood this experiment and assumed that these were droplet sprays were ballistic and didn't travel very far. But that's wrong, as we've shown before. Influenza has been known for um, 80 years. Uh, no, what, 70 years, 50, 50 years, 60 years that it's airborne but that's been forgotten. It's been shown, was shown by researchers at the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases in the 1960s that aerosolizing one to three micron particles with influenza virus produced fever and cough. The infectious dose was about one virus particle and sometimes had prolonged wheezing and nausea, but Putting hundreds of viruses in the nose caused no symptoms, just a immune reaction, of antibody production, and producing, putting in 100,000 times that dose tends to cause a mild cold, but no fever and cough. We tried to study influenza transmission with a controlled trial uh, earlier in 20, almost 10 years ago now, and uh, we had people with droplet precautions, 
wearing face shields and washing their hands every 15 minutes and control individuals. And we inoculated some of the susceptibles with virus to make them donors. And then they spent four days together, 15 hours a day. And we had one person zero convert and nobody develop a PCR positive or symptomatic as really symptomatic infection. And interestingly, only 20% were shedding any virus we could detect. But even though the, the um, CO2 and ventilation were moderately poor in the room, about 1500 parts per million, we could not detect any influenza virus in the air in the room. Whereas it's easy to detect in the air of a college cafeteria or a medical clinic during flu season. Suggesting that influenza is also an airborne transmitted infection. Layers make a difference with airborne infection. Here is an example uh, from some recent publications. This one from just last week, showing that schools in Arkansas that had high attack rates and instituted mask mandates rapidly dropped and that there were higher rates in the students and staffs uh, than in the community. And once they instituted this, it dropped back to the community level, suggesting that transmission in the school environment had been blocked and the local epidemic began to wane. Here, looking in Georgia schools at those that had not put in any ventilation improvement versus those that had done something. And there was a significantly reduced risk if there was dilution or dilution plus purification. And this is similar to what has been seen in the laboratory here using uh, HEPA filters uh, to get better air mixing that uh, if there was no HEPA filter or maybe only one, that the risk was uh, not reduced very much, but was, was a baseline risk. But once they've started running filters in the room, they reduced the risk. And if they added mass to the filters, it became much greater protection. So layers really worked. We heard a little bit about super spreading and here is uh, a recent example from uh, Omicron in South Korea where we see introduction. Most people are not transmitting, but a few cases are transmitting to many people and the environments are kindergarten, a family gathering, a workplace, a restaurant, a restaurant, a karaoke bar, a sauna. So there are clearly some environments that are high risk. Family gatherings can be an especially high risk because most of our homes, the median home in the United States has about a half an air change an hour. And the problem of course, is that pre-symptomatic transmission accounts for a large fraction of transmission, making it very difficult to control because one needs to do a lot of testing to find people who are asymptomatic. So what can we do? How can we improve these, this situation? Well, one is to put in a hierarchy of controls. And in the context of uh, a virus, engineering controls, we can isolate people from the hazard. One of the things we can do is, to, is ventilation. And the nice thing about this is that it's automatic. It doesn't require people to do the occupants of the building to do anything. The building owners and managers do need to do something. Um, and it, that is potentially a much smaller group of people that might be motivated in order to be able to keep their businesses and schools open. We've heard how masking has become a political issue. Uh, so is vaccine, all of those things ultimately are a kind of individual behavior. And we know how hard it is to implement individual behavior. The question is, can we get people to insist on clean air 
And can we get past the political impasse? Will anyone argue for dirty indoor air? I don't know, and anything's possible, but this is an example of looking at high and low ventilation buildings here in single, double, and triple, and quadruple rooms, and six liters a minute per person is the ASHRAE standard. We found that build rooms that were uh, below five appear to be at increased risk of respiratory infection transmission before the pandemic. And looking at those ventilation rates and the rates of shedding that we had previously measured for influenza and time spent together in the dorm room, we realized that people who were at that upper end of shedding are very likely to infect their roommate. And even in the low ventilation building, and, but also the high ventilation building, even in the high ventilation building, after a few hours, you're already at a 75% probability of becoming infected. So what do we do about that? It's been known for a long time that there are three radical limits to the protection achievable by ven building ventilation. This is a paper from 1991 by Ed Nardell showing that it depended a lot on how infectious the TB case was in an analysis of a, an outbreak in an office building. If you have a TB case is sending out lots of infectious doses or quanta per hour, you have to, increasing the ventilation rate, it, it's difficult to make it any dent in it. And even at moderate levels, you're still going to get 20% of the people uh, infected at very high ventilation rates, much less the 10 liters per minute or so that would be the ASHRAE standard. So what all are are, are, what are our alternatives and can we put them in places where there is the highest risk? Yes, if you have a super spreader in your house, you, there's not gonna be much you can do about it. You can reduce risk for most of the transmission that might happen in the homes. And especially if you have vulnerable elderly people, for example, in the home by filtration and, and, and mask wearing, if you know there's increased risk. but Ultraviolet germ air sanitation with germicidal UV can be extremely effective. This is an example of the equivalent air changes due to UV we achieved using pox virus aerosols, uh, a vaccinia virus uh, about uh, 15 years ago. And under some conditions, we achieved the equivalent of a thousand air changes an hour. And we now have computational fluid dynamic models of this, these experiments that have been validated by experiment. And we know how to implement these things in other environments. This is an example of upper room UV with a ceiling fan to get good mixing because that makes a huge difference in a classroom in Connecticut. So, the medical model of early testing and treatment requires detection before transmission to be effective. Um, and that works in TB, at least in developed countries, pretty well. Can it work with COVID and flu? Um, it, it's much more difficult because the transmission period is much shorter and more intense than with TB. And so, um, it's, it's, it's a lot harder to logistically to pull it off and it requires a lot of individual compliance and it's vulnerable to drug resistance as we are aware that there is, uh, Ukraine has a very high rate of multi-drug resistant TB that is probably being exported now. We don't rely on tests and treat to control cholera and salmonella we use a hierarchy of controls. We control the environment um, and we treat our water. We 
we don't drink unsanitary water, but we breathe unsanitary air. And one of the big advantages of environmental controls is that they are effective before a new agent is recognized, before we know that we're starting into a search and they don't require individual behavior. So what's the way forward? Um, I think part of it is that we need to build the expertise in the clinical community. I think a clinical lack of clinical knowledge and few experts trained in airborne infectious disease was a big handicap for the whole world um, or most of the world, maybe outside of a few places. And we need to train these new experts and we need to do research on what is most effective and how do we implement it. Um, and so we need to build that research infrastructure and test these interventions to see how much we can accomplish and to also work on the communications about these things. And the uh, picture here is of a restaurant in Northern Virginia that uses 222 nanometer UV. That is a, uh, a shorter wavelength of UV that can be, does not need to be restricted to the upper room because it's safe for your eyes as well as your skin and they can bathe the entire room in UV to achieve uh, a high rate of effect of, of air sanitation. And as we've seen, it's these kind of places where we gather and religious building gatherings, uh, restaurants, bars, uh, and maybe schools that are critical in COVID. We know that schools are very important in influenza. We can do something about this. We're not helpless. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don. That was wonderful. Um, really, really interesting. I mean, I could go on. We could have a conversation now for a while, but I'll get, I'll get to the audience questions given um, we have keep things on schedule here. Um, so the first question I have for you is um, from the audience is, um, to what extent have advances in understanding how of how COVID is transmitted led us to reevaluate uh, transmission mo models of other diseases? Are other diseases more airborne than previously understood? Well, I think it's, um, yes, I think it is causing people to rethink what we thought or what most people thought they knew about influenza, especially, but also maybe rhinovirus and uh, RSV. I think we still have a lot to learn. And I think we still need uh, some critical additional evidence to nail down how these things are transmitted to, to, to uh, I, I worry that as, as this pandemic recedes, that people will get complacent again. Um, measles was understood in the forties to be airborne, but after we had a vaccine, people forgot about it. It wasn't until some CDC studies done in the eighties that it, textbooks began to change. 19, when I was in medical school in the late seventies, measles was still not an airborne infection. So we need to establish the concrete scientific basis for these infections, understanding how they transmit and what particle sizes are important and what interventions really work. Thank you. Um, and uh, second question here is, um, is as follows, CDC's latest COVID scientific brief from 2022 still says inhalation of respiratory droplets without any mention of aerosols. Could you speak to why, how or why neglecting, uh, they're neglecting explicitly state aerosols uh, and or why this is problematic? Yeah, I think it, um, by saying inhalation, they certainly are implying that it's aerosols, but by fudging it, by saying respiratory droplets, um, I think they end up confusing people and it gets back to that um, a media communications uh, a training that we need. Uh, I think part of it is that there are still centers of resistance within the physicians and scientists who are very old school infection protection and control in CDC, much like we've seen in many parts of Canada 
where denial of airborne transmission has been uh, a major theme throughout this pandemic. That's why we need this, this, uh, this solid scientific data. It, it seems crazy to be doing randomized controlled trials of transmission, perhaps to many who are convinced by the data we have. But without that, we're still going to have people resisting it. And we're also going to have building managers who don't want to spend the money on fixing their buildings. Great. Um, there, there are a few more questions here. I will share those with you just to keep us on schedule. A wonderful talk, wonderful uh, answers uh, here. And I really, really appreciate you joining us for this symposium today. Um, and uh, thanks, thanks again. It's on. Uh, okay. Well, with this, um, we're going to just kind of keep going. I'm going to hand it over to uh, my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Angela Wilkins, and I will just let her take her, take it over from here for our next speaker. Hi, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lauren Hopkins. Uh, Dr. Hopkins is the Chief Environmental Science Officer for the City of Houston. She is also the Chief of the Bureau of Community and Children's Environmental Health for the Houston Health Department. And then she is also a professor in practice for, here at the Rice for the Department of Statistics. Her talk today is titled, Establishing, Maintaining, and Growing a Wastewater Epidemiology Surveillance Program for the City of Houston. Lauren, thank you so much for uh, doing this today. And thank you for inviting me. Are we good? We are. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, uh, today I'll be talking about the City of Houston SARS-CoV-2 Wastewater Surveillance, Surveillance Program, um, looking at how it started, where we are now, and ideas for the future. Um, first, I want to say that partnership is key to this program success. I lead the team along with my partners, Dr. Enzer and Dr. Stadler, both here at Rice. Um, and I would say that wastewater surveillance from monitoring, analyzing, interpreting, and public health intervention spans multiple expertise areas which requires cross collaboration and flexibility to turn around actual information quickly with high statistical confidence. So we think of our program as divided into three uh, components, uh, the wastewater sampling analysis engineering component, the analytics statistical modeling assessment component, and the interpretation of public health interventions and action component. So on this slide, you can get a sense of the cross collaboration required just from the leaders of the different organizations. The light blue here is City of Houston Engineers and Public Works. Uh, the orange are the City of Houston Health Department scientists and public health professionals. And the dark blue are the rice researchers. So to make this work, each of the organizations had to um, really work fluidly together. And to get to this point, there are many other researchers, like many, many, many uh, people uh, spent time on this. Um, and I want to take a second to acknowledge them. Um, from Baylor College of Medicine, it was Dr. Marissa's lab, um, other folks from Houston Water, and many other important researchers from Rice um, worked on um, supporting projects around this and getting this off the ground. And then I'd like to acknowledge the funders for this uh, uh, work surrounding wastewater surveillance. Um, so to start, what is SARS-CoV-2 wastewater surveillance? Um, you probably heard that it's happening because it's growing across the country. And here's just a screenshot from March 8th, uh, the public dashboard that's run by the Centers for Disease Control the um, National Wastewater Surveillance System, which we refer to as NEWS. It shows a proportion of samples in a sewer shed that were positive for that sewer shed over a 15-day window at 485 sites sampled in the U.S., um, all across the U.S. And you can see that the major cities are highlighted. 
This is all within the last two years that these programs have begun. It starts with a person um, positive for the virus using the restroom. And people infected with the COVID um, shed the virus in uh, their, their feces. And then that wastewater from the household, uh, the viral fragments that that person sheds gets into the wastewater treatment system and it flows all the way to the wastewater treatment plant. We collect a sample as it flows into the wastewater treatment plant and then we take it to the lab and then analyze that uh, sample for SARS-CoV-2. It turns out that this is a really powerful tool for COVID-19. Um, and for surveillance because it's unbiased um, and the fact that we're sampling everyone in the system and not relying on um, really the, the testing, the clinical PCR testing of individuals. So, how do we bring SARS-CoV-2 wastewater surveillance to Houston and what does the program look like now? Here's a timeline of the development of our wastewater surveillance program. In blue and um, are the, are the uh, wastewater surveillance um, actions that we took. In orange are the big pandemic moments um, in our city. And so the city shuts down first on March, 2020. And then I actually started discussing the use of wastewater surveillance uh, for monitoring of the virus in April with Dr. Stadler and Dr. Enzer and Dr. Marissa. And then we bought our first sampler um, when, um, you know, right then in, in that month and began sampling in May. Um, and it took about until July of 2020 until we were confident enough in our data to start using it um, for actual decision making. By December 2020, we were sampling at all of these locations across the city, um, with most of the samplers actually going online in May 2020. And we sampled from 39 wastewater treatment plants. And on this slide, you can see the color, um, the different colors represent the sewer shed for those wastewater treatment plants. They cover the, the whole city. And then we also sample at 75 manholes, and that's to look at individual, um, the, the status of whether there's a virus or not in an in individual location at a specific address. And then we sample for uh, wastewater at 63 lift stations, because in a sewer shed, as you want to move waste along, there are lift stations. And to look at a more granular level, even in the wastewater treatment plant, um, we actually look at, at the 63 lift stations. So this is a very huge undertaking. And that's why all that cooperation is important, or at least some of it, because logistically, you can imagine doing this every week is, is an intense effort and requires a lot of coordination. Um, I think it's probably the largest system um, in the United States. Uh, I, I, I know of a, a few other cities that, that have implemented programs, um, and, um, and I'm sure many will be coming online. Um, but right now, I, I think, um, just to give you an example, there's three wastewater uh, treatment plants being sampled in Chicago, seven in Denver, and I think about seven in Buffalo and 12 in the Bay Area area. So, so, so far, I think that this is the largest system and has been going since again, um, um, May of 2020. So what does our weekly process look like? Um, right here is the beginning of the process. We, we have a 24 hour composite implant wastewater sample that we're collecting again from those 39 wastewater treatment plants. Um, Houston is a, a large city. Um, these wastewater uh, treatment plants serve over uh, 2.3 million people. And then we also sample for these manholes in the lift stations as discussed. So, but in terms of the wastewater treatment plants, um, every Tuesday we collect a sample. It's begun on Monday um, and that represents a 24 hour sample. Those samples are picked up and they're distributed to two separate laboratories. 
um, which measure the amount of SARS-CoV-2 in the wastewater. And also we have variant tracking and sequencing that has, is done on those samples. Um, we have these two laboratories. We've always run this program because of our um, really attention to getting the highest quality confidence in the data that we can. And the, um, the point of that is, is that we want to make very sound decisions with this science, with this new science and this data um, to um, inform public health decisions. Um, so the, the, the two laboratories um, return the results. They come into a statistical model and um, um, to allow us to identify trends in the wastewater and both in time and in space, because we're fortunate enough to have all these wastewater treatment plants that we sample from, we can kind of um, uh, use that information uh, to, to look at the concentrations um, compared to each other. And we can say what parts of the city are going up and down and also in time. That data that comes out of the, uh, the statistical assessment, which includes the viral load and the variants, um, goes to the, uh, the health department to be used for intervention. Um, I just described the current system, but it took a lot of work to get uh, where we are today and depended on this collaboration across four institutions. Um, for example, we had to coordinate to get the data to these two labs as well as uh, and processing the data, sampling the data, and splitting them for delivery. And then the data quality is really important. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're very, really, um, we're focused um, in the beginning on, on, um, on defining that uh, standard operating procedure of how to interpret the data uh, so that we could um, uh, really be able to use it. This is a homogeneous sample coming in of waste where you can imagine how variable it can be in and of itself. So uh, we wanted to control whatever we could control um, by refining processes and making them as accurately as possible with low detection limits and quick turnarounds. Um, so we have these two labs working very intensely together. Um, to get at, uh, to where we felt we had statistical confidence and can use that information. So that, the beginning, I think that was um, in May through July, um, were a lot of effort dedicated by these scientists that began um, this effort. Um, so those labs, uh, those two universities did um, separate analyses. They compared, um, you know, were able to look at, you know, we split the sample, took it to each of the laboratories. Each laboratory took triplicates, or they split it in triplicate and analyzed it individually. They did uh, within lab variation to refine their methods. They did between laboratory um, assessments. And eventually we hit on what we um, now feel are very confident in this um, analysis of SARS-CoV-2 for wastewater. Um, and what you see on this slide is the top line here is the, um, the wastewater viral load and the bottom is the, the positivity rate information. That was the clinical positivity rate. Um, so after all this work, we were able to get reliable weekly data um, as well as create reports uh, of the data. So here is six months at the start of the program. Along the bottom, this is an example of the reports that come out that are really important to us. On the bottom, um, here are dates and right here are the wastewater treatment plants um, by name. And you can see the blue is not very much viral load to nothing. And then you start to see the viral load. And this is changes in the viral load by week. This right here is the, um, the, the viral load for the city. And this is the positivity rate for the city. And again, this is in the first six weeks of our program. Right down here, each one of these light green lines is the, um, the measurements that are coming through time um, from each of the uh, wastewater treatment plants. Um, modeled with a statistical, through the st statistical assessment, and this is the viral load for the whole city through that time. So this was the first six weeks, and um, that was very helpful, and this is the information that we were able to convey to um, the health department. And um, just in comparison, I always think that's amazing. Um, this is actually where we are now. So we, uh, 
this was what we saw just the slide before, and this is what we've been through and how we could see it coming. You can see the different colors and we can see the, the idea of, you know, looking at it spatially, looking at it in time, that we were able to use this information as we got it um, to make decisions and understand where we were. Um, uh, so um, the, the, the idea that we can track this in the city through time um, gave us uh, the, the, the confidence um, to make you know, decisions and that's, that, that is in our plan going forward. That as testing wanes, um, we, can, we already understand how well that we were able to define it with the, with the PCR testing wanes, so we were able to define it well with our wastewater program. And, and, that, and what I was talking about uh, on the previous slides was our wastewater viral load but we also have this separate analysis where we're looking at um, the variants. Um, and, and this is an example of looking at the variant data. So um, on the timeline, we mentioned that we added, if the slide that I was showing in the timeline of developing this program, we added tracking variants in January of 2021. And that, and that is really a growing field and, and obviously very key with all the various uh, variants that come out. In, in, and this is an example of something from the coming out of Dr. Tragen's lab in um, November of 2022. This is just an example of Omicron. You can see four weeks of Omicron data here. Um, you can see that on this first date in November, we don't, we, he starts to pick it up. Uh, we're able to find it. And then the next week, you know, much, much more in the next week and pretty soon it's everywhere. So that was our lead there. It was very quick. Uh, coming in, but we did have that lead time. And um, what you see um, on the right here was uh, that um, in these, this is our, uh, again, our positivity rate, and this is the viral load, uh, the wastewater viral load. And you can see that color, these are the weeks um, comparing to when we picked up Omicron. And um, starting November 29th, we see an increase in the viral load uh, which continues to increase. But if you can look at that, you can see that the positivity rate doesn't increase until about two weeks later. So that's another very big benefit um, besides being passive system um, that is unbiased. Um, we see this as a bellwether before we get the clinical data. So another very big advantage of the wastewater uh, surveillance system. Um, so, I haven't covered the manhole results yet, but um, report these results to schools and use the school wastewater results as a launch pad for vaccination. Um, the uh, the, um, the the next step uh, uh, with our with our data is actually um, reporting all of the information to our. Um, uh, to the health department leadership, you know, after it comes um, out of the statistical analysis, to these outbreak teams and, and the manholes, uh, that's where the manhole data information comes in. Um, we also report um, the, that that school data to the the, the manhole to the um, the vaccination team to help encourage vaccinations, and we. Um, we, we report it directly to the school nurses so that they know um, that if there is virus or not inside of their school and that gets them on heightened awareness and, and working with our strike teams to understand where the virus is in the schools. We also report it to the public through a dashboard um, that anybody can look at at any time uh, to see what the viral load is in their, um, in their zip code actually and uh, what schools were, um, we're seeing positives for the virus. In terms of the zip code outreach, how we actually use the, some of that data, this is an example of, of what we do with the, the manhole data and, and the, um, the, the school information to, to really get awareness in a community about um, the viral load, like there is virus in your community, and also the information in respect to what is the positivity rate in that zip code and what is the vaccination rate. So although 
the wastewater data is a really key component. We always put it together with other data sources that we have so that we can interpret it together holistically and that they can support each other. So in this case, we have the, 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 num the percent of vaccination uh, to reach 80%, which is our goal for each of the zip codes in the city and where this zip code lies, 42%, and where the wastewater is being found in the elementary schools inside of that zip code. So that information taken together to be a launch pad for the schools to actually work as um, uh, a place uh, to really increase vaccination uptake through information and education, combining wastewater testing and the vaccination rate in that school. Um, they, uh, we also host a, a webinar to explain the science uh, to uh, the school nurses and our public health authority here in Houston presented that and he outlined um, uh, what, uh, you know, explaining um, what, where the data comes from, what wastewater surveillance is, how they can use it. So this is um, on top of all the other things the school nurses are doing um, to help, you know, protect the children in the schools during the pandemic. It turned out that, you know, adding this one particular thing was uh, really helpful to them. They, uh, they felt that learning about this and being able to use this information um, when surveyed, uh, that they thought that it was very useful and um, wanted to learn more and wanted to keep getting that information. And um, lastly, I wanted to mention um, how you can get the waste the results. I described this, uh, this dashboard previously. Um, this is how Houston uh, provides the information to the public it's by wastewater treatment plant, by zip code level. We provide the viral load, the positivity rate, and we also provide the unvaccinated rate, again, um, so that the public can stay on top of that. So really the, the, the scientific information that is gleaned is, um, is disseminated um, on, on these four or, or three, three really key ways. The first one is uh, to the leadership of the city. And so when we're in a peak or something, um, you know, we're really watching it. Uh, the public health authority knew the weekend of getting the data and reported that to the mayor. And then the mayor had uh, press releases in and um, um, media events on the Monday uh, of the week. And then we used it for our leadership internally in executive team meetings to make decisions. Then it went to the ranks, which would be um, more the leaders of the strike teams to go into the nursing homes, the schools, um, into the neighborhood to increase vaccination sites. All that was driven by prioritization based on um, the wastewater information that I just showed you coupled with a positivity rate. And that is how we use the information in time and in space to make decisions. Um, so what, uh, what's next for wastewater surveillance? Um, just want to say that we feel like um, that uh, we've had such a positive experience with it that um, everyone, uh, the leadership in the city wants to keep it around. We have this um, really wonderful network and, uh, and we, can, we um, intend to uh, keep monitoring with it. We find it to be very helpful and we're looking for um, expansion to other viruses and, and pathogens and um, uh, and to, to, to track for, for public health and add as that extra piece of information um, uh, and, and in passive surveillance. Um, and I wanted to just show you the slide so you can understand. Uh, we saw how many people were involved in it. And uh, right now we've got it down to this cost for us is very uh, cost effective. If you can think about all the efforts that's been spent on um, outreach and testing and things like that. This is a cent per person uh, for the program on a weekly basis. Um, and it's providing really helpful information. Now, of course, the costs in the beginning were higher because when we first started talking about it um, back, back in, um, let's say, April of 2020 with the various scientists, we're very lucky to have the, the academic institutions to partner with. It really was in the research realm. 
And um, I was nervous about, I wanted to look into it. We were very busy at the health department and, um, but, and, and work with the researchers to see if we could get it up to speed. We knew it had potential, but to get it up to speed to actually get to the point where we could use it for decision-making, um, really um, effective decision-making. And so those few months in the beginning um, were really key. In addition to the two laboratories working together that, and, and the time um, and, 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 and um, resources spent on, on that work, we also, some of those researchers that I mentioned on the beginning of the slide that I acknowledge just worked on separate special studies to make sure that the data were high quality. Uh, just really, you know, so costs were associated with that. They looked at um, you know, were we going to have issues when there's temperature changes in the system because um, of our, we have really hot summers here and cooler winters, but would we be able to compare in time um, a sample result taken at a wastewater treatment plant um, in different seasons? Would we have trouble because the wastewater treatment plant, some of them are leaky, we have a closed system for our sewer, but if there was rainwater coming in, would that affect the answer? And then potentially bias our um, intervention. So we had researchers looking at that. We had researchers looking at the residence time and system. Some of the wastewater treatment plants are very large. And so if uh, a sample, uh, you know, you flush a toilet on the very far side of the system and it, there's a residence time, and by the time it gets to the, uh, to the uh, sampling point, has it decayed? Um, so our, is a wastewater treatment plant concentration sample at one waste order treatment plant that's very large comparable to one that's smaller that has smaller residence time. So lots of independent and, and, and whether the sample should be grab or composite. So these kind of things were addressed early on. And um, uh, so that those costs are not involved in that, that that's, we're building on that from here. But, but this, uh, this is the cost to run the system weekly now. Um, and, um, and so in our mind, very cost effective compared to um, the the actual you know other programs for surveillance and these are the costs by lift station more uh, I mean by manhole and lift station and these are a little bit higher and that's because we're looking at a small community um, and so um, you, you know we're 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 doing the, the exact same logistic sampling um, and analysis but it's spread over a, a smaller portion of the people. We still think this cost is really good though, because these are our, we're, when, um, when we're looking at nursing homes, jails, any congregate living facilities, there are high risk uh, populations, which we really do want to track. And in the future, um, we, um, you know, these are, are some ideas of, of what we're looking at, um, wanting to use our system to track and uh, things that we're exploring. These are, um, you know, other targets. Um, as you can imagine, the sample we think will be the same. We have the same sampling team, the same number of people. We've already bought, purchased our samplers, so a lot of the hard costs are there. It will be adding the analytical cost. And then um, I think that, as I described to you, getting that procedure down to be really as good as it can be at understanding the concentration in that sample, given that we already know that we're going to have, there'll always be other variations that we have, don't have control over. So there will be that process that we'll have to go through to really get confident with that, but um, we're hoping that we can add to that. Um, we have been working on um, one other um, um, constituent that we track in our wastewater. This is uh, flu. I wanted to share with you the, uh, the flu results. Again, um, this is uh, the, the list of schools where we analyze the, in the manhole, the, the wastewater sample and uh, the purple uh, designation here is that flu was detected in these schools. And so these schools are sampled once a week. The school nurse gets the information that there was flu found in their school within that week. Um, or no longer than one week after. So it's very actionable. And um, we hadn't been detecting flu early on, but uh, as I said earlier, we combine the wastewater information with our other health surveillance systems, our disease surveillance systems, and our real-time outbreak disease surveillance systems, um, and use that together to make interpretations. On the right here is our um, something from our disease surveillance outbreak system where we're monitoring the number of discharges um, from the emergency department with um, diagnosed influenza. And so back here when we really weren't finding much flu, it turns out there really wasn't much flu in the, out there in the world. And as we see it ticking up, we are starting to see it in the schools. 
Um, and so um, as, as we move forward, we will be tracking both of these metrics together to provide us um, you know, better and, and uh, high quality information. And uh, that's, uh, that's uh, all I have. And, and thank you for letting me uh, talk with you this afternoon. Hi, Lauren. Uh, great talk. Um, we have several questions here. Um, I don't know if you want to stop sharing screen. We can see your yes. email right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. Thank you. No problem. Um, you mentioned being able to extend this to other pathogens. Do you have any plan to be able to use these techniques on unknown pathogens? We... Uh... We do have that uh, desire to do that. And, and this disease surveillance system that I talked to you about is, uh, is also run out of my group. And uh, what we get is um, it's syndromic uh, system, you know, where some of you may be familiar with it. But so we get um, real time feed from all of the hospitals, emergency departments um, in our area. And we're always tracking it for do we see an increase in influenza like illness? Do we see an increase in um, gastrointestinal, we have syndromics um, um, that we follow. And so what I, I, what, what I would hope would happen is something like that, that's something that we have access to now, um, uh, tied with uh, the kind of work that Dr. Trading is doing and Dr. Sadler is doing. Um, and we can look to see, because it, it may be that um, when something is found in the wastewater one thing we need to know is, does it actually make us sick? So some of them do make us and some of them don't. So I feel that that connection needs to happen. And then we, we, we already have a case in point because we have that data and we have, or, or an example case, and we have the, uh, the historical COVID data. And so we can see how well um, that would have worked and, um, and like build on that going forward as we look for um, things in the wastewater uh, that are coming along and whether we see some impact in the health of the community. How did, um, every time we had a new variant, how did that affect your analysis? Because you, um, it seems like on some level you might have to start all over. Well, uh, it, you're right. <laughs> I mean, I, I think everybody felt that. I think that we're learning how to do it now. I, I have to tell you one thing that, um, that it's been really important in the partnership is the researcher, the researching team understanding the urgency of turning around the answer. Um, so we understood when, when a variant um, is in the pipeline and they're able to identify it. And even though a researcher would like to step back and make sure and look at that for a few weeks and then report, we can't do that. So they had to get their confidence up quickly. We acted quickly when Omicron came in we had an, started a, niche, a new set of meetings um, internal with the leadership and with all this information, just focusing on how to pivot because we did have the advantage of seeing it before it came. Yeah. Uh, your next question. If transmission is via aerosols, then shedding into stool is not required for virus continued survival. How will we know when an airborne virus evolves that doesn't show up in the wastewater? Does human influenza show up in the wastewater? Which yes, it does. You you said you. I think this question was asked before you answered it. <laughs> well, I mean, it is. I think that we're still working on. Uh, I think that we're still our our team. You know, is still working on seeing how well it works. Um, so I think that we'll have different successes with different um, uh, viruses and pathogens that we're trying to track. But if it isn't in the wastewater you know, um, then uh, it is not going to be a wastewater epidemiology topic. There will be other surveillance systems yeah. that we're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that points to um, if you guys aren't attacking, you know, detecting it and somebody else is, then that says something about the virus or the, the pathogen. That's true. That's true. Yes, we do have, um, we do have active systems now that, that we look for, you know, um, concerns in the air. So, uh, did wastewater surveillance data show some characteristics of the region being monitored that are related to the transmission number of positive cases in that region? Yes, uh, actually, I think the question is, were we able to take the wastewater data and project the number of cases? Yeah. 
Yes, uh, that we, we do that. And we actually um, are, um, we, we combined our seroprevalence. We did a seroprevalence study here in Houston. Um, so they, that was a randomized study that looked at, um, at how many uh, people out there had antibodies, which we knew that means that they had the virus, but um, not necessarily showing up in our disease surveillance system because, of course, not everybody gets tested. They're asymptotic or, or asymptomatic or um, whatever uh, the reason. And so we have an under ascertainment factor that we develop from that. And we also have our our PCR database, and we have a very nice data set of when we have really good PCR testing data, when, because the testing data, the clinical testing data waxes and wanes with people's interest in the availability of tests. And now with the antigen tests, you know, it's, we, you know, we definitely have not everything being reported to our disease system. So, but we do have a period where we have both and we've been able to uh, very, nicely um, model uh, out how many cases, we can predict the cases. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I, it's really just amazing getting to hear about you know, the progress of this work over the last two years. Every time you guys talk about this, everybody's glued to it because it's just so fascinating. Thank you. Well, we have our next speaker, uh, one of my favorite postdocs here at Rice, uh, Dr. Mauricio Rigo, is a postdoctoral research associate with the Department of Computer Science here at Rice University. He is developing computational tools and algorithms to predict, to predict the binding mode of ligands, small peptides to protein receptors involved in immunological responses. Uh, he will be talking, you know, he will be sharing his talk today. It's on structural and silicial strategies towards COVID-19 mitigation. Thank you, Angela. I hope you can all see my screen. Yes, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. It is really a great uh, pleasure and an honor to be among such amazing uh, speakers today. And what I would like to show to you is a little bit about what we have been doing in our lab. And the title of my, uh, of my, uh, my talk here is Structuring Silico Strategies Towards COVID-19 Mitigation. And uh, my name is Maurice, and I'm a postdoctoral research associate at Kavrak Lab. I'm on the computer science department uh, from Dr. Lydia Kavraki. And I'd like to set a little bit the stage here about what I'm going to talk because it's not exactly about epidemiology, but more uh, in respect with the tools that we can develop, uh, computational tools that we can develop and can be used uh, for COVID 19 mitigation. So, our lab, we are trying to do is these, like develop tools that are accessible to the community and that can be used to guide in vitro experiments and help to formulate new biological hypotheses. And among several tools, there are three that I'd like to outline here because I will talk about those. I will talk a little bit about SARS Arena and then I'll go to HLA Arena and Dean COVID. And I'd like to start with SARS Arena. And the idea of SARS Arena, just to set a little bit, uh, talk a little bit about the background, why we developed this tool. So we know that COVID-19 pandemic is caused by this novel strain of SARS-CoV-2. And what we have been observing the, during the pandemic is this fast growing number of new variants and confirmed cases worldwide. So this is what's happening, variants is coming like in waves. So as, uh, as we can see in this graph, and one of the reasons why we have these variants is because the virus is evolving and is mutating. In one of these proteins that are, we have a lot of uh, selection pressure is exactly a protein that is located on the envelope, pro, uh, an envelope of the virus, the spike protein. So these proteins that are in the envelope, they are more prone to mutations. And so they are more susceptible to this selection pressure. So, uh, and the vaccines that we have, they are based on the spike protein. And this could, could interfere, this could actually uh, be one of the reasons why 
a long time, we can have a decrease on the efficacy of these vaccines. So what we want to propose here is that exactly we have other proteins that we can look into. And one of these proteins actually that will not suffer such a uh, strong pressure selection as spike protein is the nucleocapsid protein or N protein. And I bring here some of the papers that show that N protein actually can trigger an immune response, so can be used as an alternative uh, for, for future uh, vaccine development. So for instance, in 2004, there was this paper where the results indicated that N protein was recognizing most of the serum of the patients. Uh, here in the second work, for instance, a lot of epitopes were found exactly on nucleocapsid protein, even more that, for instance, on spike protein. So there is ground to look to other proteins besides spike protein. So, and this is another interesting paper because uh, here the authors recovered uh, immune cells from patients that were recovered from SARS. And these cells were stimulated with peptides from N protein. And they evaluate how these peptides will elicit and cellular immune response. And what they observed was that CD80 cells and also CD40 cells were able to recognize peptides from this protein and trigger immune response through the releasing of this cytokine called interferon gamma. The interferon gamma is a cytokine that will be present in inflammatory responses. So this is pointing out for, okay, and protein can be used again to trigger immune response. And also interesting on that is that it's not all peptides that will elicit the same immune response. So as you can see here, the peptide pools one to six, these are different regions of the N protein. And these different regions, they can trigger immune response in a, in a gradient, like in different levels. Uh, observing that, we noticed that, okay, it would be interesting to develop a tool where we can retrieve all the sequences from nucleocapsid protein and analyze searching for conserved residues in these and proteins because probably the conserved residues, the conserved regions uh, will not be so exposed to the pressure selection. This is probably important for the virus and then analyze these conserved regions in a structural manner. So SARS arena is about that. It's about the analysis of the sequence of nucleocapsid protein, but also including structural analysis. And since our lab has expertise on the CD80 cell immune response, we are focusing on this type of response. Just to give you, show you a little bit about uh, the structure of what we are seeing here. We have normally these HLAs, human leukocyte antigens, they will present the peptides for this TCR represented here in green and yellow. And you can see that the TCR will kind of see the PHLA, the peptide and the HLA, but not only see topography, but also electrostatic change in these molecules. So this is one of the things why we are interested in studying this structure of the peptide HLA. So we are interested in study the conserved regions of this N protein, but also how these peptides can be presented by different HLA molecules. And in fact, there are uh, also some uh, targets in the literature. This is actually a, a famous one where you can see that this is like different epitopes right here. You can see that this is our different peptides being presented by this molecule, by this HLA. But although they are different, and even from different uh, strains of SARS, they have like these hot spots. And these hot spots are pretty similar, and they are sufficient to be recognized by the same PCR. So in this case, this is interesting because we can think about a broadened immune response uh, where the same type of response that we observe in one SARS, SARS one we can observe in another because it's the same PCR recognizing those targets. And this is uh, a cross-reactive uh, immune response, we call it this way. So talking about SARS arena specifically, uh, we SARS arena is a, a pipeline that we built uh, onto these two workflows. And the interesting about SARS arena is that all the softwares, they are installed 
inside Docker. We have these containers on Docker with all the software installed there. So all the user needs is just to download Docker and it, will, it is not supposed to have problems about uh, computational requirements and everything. So it's kind of an easy tool to use. And we also are using Jupyter Notebooks so the user can see actually what the code is doing. And if the user has some experience, can actually modify the code as you wish. Uh, Source Arena has these two workflows. The first workflow, the workflow one, is more directed to, towards the sequence analysis of these end proteins, while the second workflow is more directed to the structure analysis. And I'm going through each one of those. So in the workflow one, first thing that our pipeline will do after the user sets some, uh, some filters, like for instance, uh, sample to be analyzed or variant from where you want to retrieve the end protein. So after setting these filters, you can actually fetch proteins from CDI virus. And these proteins will perform a multiple sequence alignment. So uh, the idea of doing this is to compute, being able to compute a conservation score and actually find among several of these proteins where the peptides that are the most conserved ones, they are localized. And you can actually tune the conservation value. So at the end, you have a list of peptides depending on the conservation value that you use. So this is also something that the user can do. After having this list of peptides, you can actually use in workflow two. In workflow two, the first input, input one, is exactly the peptide sequence that you got from uh, 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 workflow one in workflow two. And the second input is the HLA sequence that the user wants to use to, to model these peptides. Once the user chooses the HLA sequence, we run a sequence binding, uh, a sequence binding predictor to MHC flurry just to see where these peptides will bind, if these peptides will bind to each one of these HLAs. And then we model these HLAs, the three-dimensional structure of those, and we combine both using another tool also developed in our lab, that is ApeGen. And using ApeGen, we can actually have the structure of the peptide HLA, and using specific scoring functions, we can create an hierarchy. We can actually say, okay, this is the peptides that will bind better or not to the MHC, and we can uh, create this order to be used later or the user as he wish. So this is the summary about SARS Arena. So this is a pipeline that will allow users to search and analyze conserved residues in SARS-CoV-2 proteins. SARS Arena will allow you filter by geographic location, pangoline age sample, among others. And the 3D complex here can be used in surface analysis to search for search shared structure patterns, for instance, like in the example that I gave you before. My second, uh, the second tool that I want to show you here is HLA Arena, that it is also connected in some part with SARS Arena. Not that's why the names, they are close to each other because the last part of SARS Arena is pretty connected to HLA Arena. And here I'm going to show you a little bit about the tool, what we can do with that. But I also want to show how HLA Arena was used in a specific context where we analyzed the relationship between peptides from BCG and SARS-CoV-2. So the same way as SARS Arena, HLA Arena is a customizable environment where we can do structural modeling and analysis of peptide HLA. And the same way we have Docker container, we have the Jupyter notebooks. And at the beginning, we created HLA Arena specifically for cancer immune therapy, but this is a versatile versatile uh, tool that can be used in other uh, set, uh, in other words. So inside HLA Arena, we find all the software that is necessary to run uh, docking, to run modeling of proteins and everything else. And you can see here that HLA Arena is divided in these three main workflows that we call the geometry prediction workflow, the binding prediction, and the virtual screen. If your user wanted, also can create his own workflow. And in each one of these workflows, 
we have these three parts, the input processing, the peptide docking, and the data analysis. On the input processing, the HL Arena will just uh, get the, all the information that it needs, proteins, models, et cetera, fix that, and use that in the next phase that is the peptide docking. And the data analysis can be performed all inside these Jupyter notebooks. And for what I wanted to show to you today, I want to focus in one of these workflows that is the binding prediction workflow. Uh, and we use HLA Arena uh, to, to study this relationship that I told you before about BCG and SARS-CoV-2. You may remember that at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, there were uh, um, or suggestions, right, saying that countries with BCG vaccination programs could be associated with this reduced number or severity of COVID-19 cases. And this was intriguing because uh, BCG is supposed to protect against uh, tuberculosis. And this is a live attenuated mycobacterium bovis. Um, it's, a, it's a bacteria in this. And then it was interesting how uh, people would be protected with taking one vaccine against SARS-CoV-2. And we went to the literature and started to talk about this. And one of the things and the hypothesis that, we, hypothesis that we formulate is that, okay, we have peptides from BCG that are very similar to peptides found in the proteome of SARS-CoV-2. So what we probably are we're going to see here is a cross-reactive T-cell response. So the same clonotype, the same TCRs, are recognizing peptides from BCG and SARS-CoV-2. So how can we test that? Because this involves a lot of data, a lot of uh, sequence to be analyzed. So we start doing our, our pipeline for that. The first thing we did was to recover the proteome from BCG and SARS-CoV-2. And we, we use an approach of the sliding window method to generate all possible non-redundant non-number peptides because those are the main ones that will bind to HLAs. And we select HLAs that were uh, in some way connected to SARS-CoV-2 from what we got from literature. So in this first part, we filter which of these non-numbers would bind to each one of these HLAs using a sequence-based uh, sequence predictor. And then after that, we perform the structure modeling and the biochemistry similarity of these peptides. And specifically for structure modeling, here's where HLA Arena was used because we needed to model more than 300,000 PHLA complexes. And we were able to modify the code of HLA, HLA Arena to run in a parallel mode because otherwise this would take, would take more than years to finish and we could finish that in months. After we did that, this comparison, uh, after we modeled these complexes and we got biochemical similarity of each one of these peptides, we extract these features and using a hierarchical cluster analysis. And what we were looking here was based on this feature, what peptides, what pair of peptides between BCG and SARS would be the most similar ones. And how is this connected with what we already have in the literature? What uh, um, what of these peptides will have some immunogenicity value associated to? At the end, we were able to got stable with 40 possible pairs that I'll show at the end uh, of this part. And here we screen over 13 million possible cross-reactive peptide pairs from BCG and SARS-CoV-2. It was uh, really a work with a lot of data. And just to visualize what I'm saying to you, so in A here, you can see the peptide HLA, uh, the peptide in yellow, the, in green you have the HLA. And you have this, uh, if we compute electrostatic potential, you can see here in this green grid, this is basically what the TCR can actually a very way to trigger not immune response. So we focus our analysis on this part of the DMC. And you can see in B that we generated these dendrograms uh, where we included uh, if the peptide has or, not, or don't have evidence in the literature about monogenicity, and we cluster the closest was closest ones using a DFS algorithm. Uh, after that, doing that, we came with 
uh, a series of putative uh, cross-reactive clusters. And we got into this table with these 40 peptides that we can suggest as possible cross-reactive ones. One thing that is interesting to observe is that if we see exactly to the surface that we are analyzed, to the PHLA surface, which means the surface that the TCR will see, we can see the resemblance between each one of these pairs. But among them, they are not similar. So probably here, if we have some cross reactive response, is between these pairs. And the next phase would be, of course, testing these in vitro. In fact, we already have uh, a collaboration in Brazil that is interested in starting these experiments now. But this is, uh, this is the take home message because we were able to use an in silico tool to actually select, filter the most probable uh, cross reactive targets instead of using 13 million of possible pairs. That would be infeasible, not be um, adequate. We will not uh, be able to do right now what, with what we have. So as a summary of HL Arena, our study produced this list of monogenic tcg derived peptides that may prime this cell cross activity against SARS-CoV-2. And this large data set was only uh, possible to be modeled thanks to the HLA Arena uh, that we developed. And I want to finish my presentation with uh, another tool that is also in respect to COVID, that is COVID. Now I will not talk specifically about HLA. Uh, I will talk more in the context of other proteins uh, from SARS-CoV-2. And again, just to give you some background on this, each one of the SARS-CoV-2 proteins, you know, has a special role in the virus adaptation. So each one of these proteins can actually be used as a target for drug development. And one way to assess this is an in silico matter using mainly molecular docking progress. But the problem with the molecular docking is that most of the times uh, these approaches will not consider the inherent flexibility of the proteins. And this is what we want with Team COVID. We want to provide a web server where the user can use docking, actually ensemble docking, with flexible SARS-CoV-2 proteins. So just to uh, graphically show what I'm, I'm saying to you. So you can see here in the right, this is one of the proteins that we have uh, on SARS-CoV-2. This is the main protease. And you can see that we can, uh, there is a specific part of the main protein that is, that is the binding site, where here we have an in inhibitor bound to the protein. If we zoom in this part, you can see that if I superimpose several proteins that are found in protein databases of crystal structures, we actually will see that there's a lot of variation around this binding site. And this is important because this variation can interfere on the binding affinity of this inhibitor, on the stability of this inhibitor. So this is what we are uh, wanted to, to do here with Dinko, with account for this whole flexibility of the proteins. Of course, that the, uh, uh, without the tool, the user can do that, you know, but would, there would be a lot of challenges to, to, to superimpose. So, to uh, in the way. So the user, for instance, should have expertise on tools used to generate these conformations of proteins. The selection of these conformations, the representative ones, is not something that is easy to do. And also at the end, the user will need to implement a protocol to use this conformation document study. So what we want here is to provide this set of recomputed conformations for different proteins of SARS-CoV-2 to select uh, these conformations in an uh, optimized and automatically manner using PCA and other dimensional reduction methods, and also implement the algorithm that we will use these conformations in an ensemble docking. And I'll not go into much details of COVID, but just to understand how we developed these. The first thing that we did, we went to, we went to Protein Data Bank this is a database where we have all the crystal structure, all the three-dimensional uh, uh, 
three-dimensional conformations of the, the proteins that were already released through some in vitro experiment. So at the time, we had information for the main protease, for the PL Pro and our DRP. The main protease is the one that we was the one that we had most of the, the structures. And you can see that each one of these proteins have a specific binding site. And in the case of main proteins, we have two binding sites, two places where inhibitors can bind, either the catalytic or the allosteric site. After recovering these uh, proteins, we cannot use all of them in a molecular docking study because this is computationally unfeasible. So we need to find a way to, uh, to get only representative conformations from the set of structures that we have. So we use dimensionality reduction with PCA and clustering to do that. But we also know that there are other forms that the protein can actually um, appear in the nature in a physiological environment. So how can we assess that? That's why we use molecular dynamics. So we, we got uh, which one of these proteins and we perform a molecular dynamics using different force field, simulating how the protein will behave in an eco solution in a physiological environment. By doing molecular dynamics, we can extract more than 100,000 conformations. So uh, again, we cannot use all of these conformations. That's why we use only representative ones. At the end, we had these different ensemble of conformations. What I'm showing you here in these graphs below in gray, these are the whole, like the, the low, uh, uh, the, whole, the whole structures that we have, either using the crystals or the molecular dynamics. And in the red one, you can see that these are the conformations that were in fact selected through our method. So these are the representative ones. That's why we are calling our ensemble. And that's why we are doing the ensemble docking. We want to use each one of these conformations in a docking uh, study to search for other inhibitors. And these are just the numbers uh, represented in these, in these graphs. Just again, show you some visual about this. Uh, here we can, we can see the main protease crystal ensemble. And if you look to the, uh, the catalytic side and also the side, you can see that there's a lot of movement around this side. So uh, a lot of atoms uh, assuming different conformations and different positions. And these in fact will interfere with the, with the way uh, that the in, an impossible, uh, impossible inhibitor will bind. Uh, and then COVID is now offered as a web server. So it's pretty easy, easy to use. All the user needs is to upload a ligand and then choose a receptor and ensemble to use, put an email. And at the end, you got your results that you can also open in our web server, download these results or actually interact with the web server uh, if you wish to see some uh, peculiarity. And another important thing is that we are always updating the COVID. So for instance, like now, right now, we already put other proteins like spike protein and helicase protein. In the case of helicase, we have two uh, possible binding sites. And we also offer the user the options to use the all ensembles in the analysis because previously it was just uh, one or another. And we are very happy that the program is being used worldwide. So until now, almost 3,000 users uh, used in COVID. And this is the summary. The COVID offers this ready-to-use solution for researchers to account for protein flexibility while testing compounds against SARS-CoV-2 proteins, and also allows users to run ensemble docking experiments without the additional burden of time-consuming simulations required for ensemble generation and docking preparation. And with these tools, we hope to provide platforms and pipelines for the discovery of new SARS-CoV-2 targets, while also helping on the development of new therapies for COVID-19 treatment. And also these tools, they can, we can broaden the scope of use of them for designing, for instance, new therapeutics or investigating in evidence in the context of personalized immune therapy, which means we can act, uh, these are pretty versatile tools that we can use for other, uh, in other fields. And I'd like to thank you, uh, all the all people that was uh, uh, involved with each one of these 
uh, with the work that I showed to you. And if you have any questions or if you want to contact me, I'll be glad to, uh, to provide you more explanation about the tools and even pass to the code and we can discuss about it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have many questions, so let me get started. Uh, Should I stop the sharing? Oh yeah, you know what? Yeah, stop the sharing unless you think you okay. might need the slide. <laughs> Uh, okay, so earlier on you were talking about a SARS arena. Right now you are focusing on N protein. Is it possible to analyze other proteins? As a matter of fact, yes, we can analyze other proteins. And because the way we are getting these proteins is through the NCBI virus. So we are fetching the proteins from there. And inside SARS arena, we can, uh, the user can actually have a tab where you can define which of the proteins you want to analyze. Of course, we are testing the problem more towards the nucleocapsid protein. So we can assure, for instance, the time that we take to perform the multiple sequence alignment of other proteins. This can be something that we interfere because for some proteins, you have much more residues, much uh, are longer proteins. So this is one of the things, but yeah, definitely uh, we, can, we can do that. We can insert other proteins. Um, I... Next question, how easily can this computational modeling approach be adapted to new pathogens when we see, uh, that we see in the future? How easily, each one of those, like the three? Well, I think they meant the second one when the question was asked, but I, I, maybe the answer is similar for all three. Uh, yeah, so, uh, Right now, uh, I will talk about the second one because the second one, one HLA Arena, at the beginning when we start analyzing the CG and SARS, uh, this was something that we got stuck because we got too many peptides to be analyzed. So right now, we have a way to do that. We know how to do that and we develop ways to make HLA Arena works faster. So I would say that now it's just a matter of see what we what is our problem and then just run. It was not supposed to be, take so long. For instance, when, when I said that when we start with the DCG, this will take like years to perform and now we can do it in months. So I believe that for new pathogens, we can work in the same way. We can follow maybe uh, a similar protocol and this would be interesting to do. How does the process work to include new proteins in Gene COVID web server? Yeah, sure. So at the beginning, we start looking for proteins in the protein data bank for proteins that we already have the crystal structure. And we start using molecular dynamics to also generate more confirmation for this protein. So this is the basic process. If you want to insert new proteins, this would be like the basic process that we can follow. Uh, the burden here is to run the molecular dynamics simulations and then uh, run uh, the ensemble selection part, but mostly the molecular dynamics simulation take longer. But this is the way that we can do. And in the case of uh, spike protein, for instance, that is there, we got this simulation from, uh, from other researchers. So we can actually do that too. We can actually get some uh, experiments on molecular dynamics for different proteins and extract the confirmation of those used in our protocol and insert inside the COVID. So it's kind of straightforward to do that. You know, because somebody actually asked about the spike protein, do you know, is, is it known if the spike protein either from the virus itself or the vaccine induces an autoimmune response in the endothelial cells? In the, yeah. oh, if induced immune response, yeah. yeah. So I, I read something about that, but I'm not sure to give an opinion on that. Uh, I, I read something about the, the influence of uh, this protein and Gilead Barre, but I'm, I'm not able to discuss, you know, deeply on that. So yeah, don't worry. Yeah, about but it. this is definitely something that worth, you know, looking into, especially because I have a friend that has an autoimmune disease, and he asked me, "How can we evaluate that? Is there a way to do that?" We can. We can do more research to find for these uh, autologous uh, uh, targets that would be similar to spike protein. Yeah. 
Uh, someone's double checking if you have a local version of uh, Dean COVID. I mean, I, I think you said that basically you have a Docker. So yep. basically anybody can run it from anywhere as long as they can put that Docker somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, can, uh, you can pull from Docker and you can use it. And this is a way you can do it. Or you can use a web server that is uh, hosted on uh, at Orion at Rice University. And if you have any problem pulling the program or trying to install on your own, uh, please just send me an email and we'll get connected and we can help to, to use that. Our last question. I think this kind of sure. points to an interesting idea. Does your computational platform enable cl collaborative contributions from the community? Can scientists work together on collaborative areas to get involved? And so this points to maybe, have you guys thought about crowdsourcing? Uh, well, we, we didn't discuss that, but definitely it would be something interesting. Yeah, yeah, we, but we, did, we didn't discuss it, but yeah, why not? I think it'd be interesting okay. for sure. Something to think about. Okay. Yeah. It great. has been great to see you do your talk again and uh, uh, getting to watch your journey. And uh, <laughs> I look forward to hearing more from you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your words, kind words. Okay. Bye. See you later. Well, we have our last speaker today, and it actually it looks like we're a couple minutes ahead of time, so I hope Sonia's ready. But we have Dr. Sonia Villapol. Uh, she is an assistant professor with neurosurgery at the Center of Neurogeneration at Houston Methodist Research Institute. Her research is focused on neurogeneration, inflammation, neurorestoration, microbiome, nanotechnology for drug delivery in several, in several brain injury animal models, including uh, pharmacological approaches to repair the injured brain. Today, she is talking about long COVID and what will remain after the pandemic. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. And thank you for inviting me. So I, uh, yeah, I'm mean sharing my, my presentation. We can see it fine. Perfect. Thank you. So yeah, so as uh, as you say, I I going to talk about uh, uh, what we will keep after these two years, or or even more, or or infections and in, and in, in virus and in, you know and in, in cases and in, in, in transmission and all these studies. So uh, when when the vaccination globally will be uh, uh, something quite real, um, we remain these uh, effects and these symptoms that. Um, that happen in the, in the some percentage of people that gets infected. So uh, even when the pandemia, we can say that is over, um, we're still thinking about uh, the, 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 all the symptoms related to the long COVID. So for the, for the first time, the, the, the first thing that, that we need to think about is, <clears throat> is believe that you're real. So that is a kind of um, issue and a problem you know, for most, most of the patients. Um, they they don't consider that these symptoms that are a, a product of infection. So mostly they say that it's a it's a like a neuropsychological problem or it's a product of the stress of the pandemic, etc. So the first thing that we need to do to help the the the, the patients is is tell them that it's real, right? And then we need to start to to analyze because so far um, is the the unseen public health crisis that we we have in front of us and. In, in the, because we don't know that much about um, the, the long COVID. So the, there are a, a constellation of symptoms. It's not uh, um, only a, a few, there are uh, hundreds of symptoms that are associated with the, with the uh, infection. And it's not always related to the severity of the, of the acute infection by SARS-CoV-2. So these symptoms that are, uh, for example, the fatigue, the short of breath, the brain fog, uh, sleep disorders, uh, fever, gastrointestinal symptoms, anxiety or depression, for example. And they can be only one uh, symptom or a couple or multiple, or like there are people that they, 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 are, they have like 20 symptoms at the same time. And they can be constant, so they can be transient, they can appear, disappear. Uh, anyway, so it's it's kind of complex and, and it's very specific, individualized. So that every every patient or, or person has different symptomatology. So they 
they need to be um, analyzed by by separate right so definitely is, we don't know exactly the magnitude of this problem and and but most of the people uh, within that will be a, a public health uh, impact uh, will have an important impact uh, in the in the future months or even years so but anyway, we know that the most of the people, that is the reality, that most of the people, they, they are fully recovered, right? After four weeks after the infection, the four to, to six weeks. But there are a percentage of people that they um, they have all these, some of these symptoms, uh, even present uh, after four weeks. Uh, that is the, the concept of long COVID. And then can be extended to eight weeks, 12 weeks, and even years. So the factors associated with the long COVID so there are, uh, for example, the, the female, the gender, there are uh, high risk in females of the middle, middle age, uh, white ethnicity, uh, specifically they have two or more uh, co common more, more, more of so the COVID-19, and also there are associated to the severity of the disease. So you have uh, severe, uh, severe disease, severe COVID, have more chance to develop a non COVID. So that is another uh, reality. And what we know uh, about long COVID so far, um, the few um, things that we are learning, learning every every week, there are uh, some new research or some um, new facts about long COVID. But we know that there are affected um, the predominance in there are in women between 30 and 15 years old. Many of the symptoms and they and they are um, as a product of might or to moderate COVID, acute COVID. And in people that they don't have uh, previous issues, health problems, uh, have met the criteria of the chronic fatigue or, or fibromyalgia, they are these patients that they suffer this disease. Um, and then uh, it's not very clear. There are some factors that they say that the vaccination improved COVID, but there are not, um, uh, we don't know exactly why in some people, yes, and another not. And then, uh, and then definitely the, most of the, the symptoms disappear so they are atten attenuated after one year but not all them so um, several publications for example this systematic review is is very clear on that in in can provide some answers about who common there are the symptoms in people that they who have like a, a my tbi or or sorry my COVID or or a symptomatic COVID. so that means someone that passed it, had the infection and, and they after two weeks they were recovery and months later, they present some of these symptoms. So the percentage of this meta-analysis that was were all the studies until September 2021, 20, uh, uh, they show that there are percentage between the 30 and 60 percent of the infected people who present mild or asymptomatic COVID that they develop long COVID. May, the, most of them there are in women, and 35 percent they have no comorbidities associated. That means and not diabetes or high um, or hypertension, et cetera, et cetera. So what is the role of the vaccination here? Uh, we know that the, the, the vaccinated people can also have long COVID, but uh, it's good to get vaccinated or is indifferent. So the, the data we have so far um, is there are not a lot, but uh, they mostly they show that the, uh, the double of people and the vaccines, they reduce the risk of long COVID in a half. And, and as well, we know that there are a percentage of people that they, uh, after the, the vaccination, they, they worse the disease of the long COVID. So we don't know exactly why this thing happened, but uh, mostly of the people, or one in four people they, with long COVID, after the vaccination, they, they stop the symptoms. So that is, um, is some hope. So definitely, uh, we were vaccinated, we were protected against the the COVID, the acute phase, and as well the long COVID. But uh, if you already have the, the long COVID and you get the vaccine, there are a percentage of people that they don't recover and we need to figure out why this thing happened. And, and, for, and there are a lot of research uh, I'm going on right now about long COVID, and, and it's, it's, it's amazing all the publications daily and week by week, we know more things. If you go to the Wikipedia website, you have the, the, the some critical points about long COVID definition and what's mean is like a, the concept of long COVID. They are um, the denomination is the post um, acute uh, 
a sequel of COVID-19 or PAS, that it was the definition that the NH uh, uh, adopting also the, the WHO in the last months. So, and then there are a lot of tone of symptoms that are associated with that. This schematic, this figure that you see here is the figure of from our uh, review and meta-analysis that we published the last year. So uh, we identified in 2020, uh, be, of course, before that, the vaccination, that uh, all the studies they were describing long COVID, uh, even in people that they require hospitalization or, or people that they pass the disease um, with my symptoms or asymptomatic. So we identified the 80% of the people, they, they have some symptom, unless one symptom after the, the four weeks after the infection, right? So that was uh, huge, right? Because it's most of the, of the people, they, they will suffer something. And this number was reduced over time, in, and especially because the, the vaccination uh, play a role here in, and they reduce this percentage, fortunately. And most of the symptoms that we, we identify were the fatigue that affect the 60% of the people, head, uh, attention disorder, uh, heart loss and dyspnea, for example, but as well the persistent cough in 20% of the population, even uh, digestive disorders, arrhythmia, myocarditis. Uh, one symptom that was, was quite uh, interesting was the 1% of the, of the people they developing uh, hypertension, something that is really difficult to identify if you, because it doesn't present symptoms. So this is after a routinary uh, clinical checking or checking up. So that was something that called our attention. And, and also we, we identify another symptoms like, for example, less common, but like a post-traumatic disease, um, uh, post-traumatic disorder and, and even stroke in ictus. So you can see here in the, in the uh, right side, all these columns of symptoms that are neurological symptoms. So it's, it's quite predominant, even uh, more than the rest of the of the symptomatology. But this, uh, the previous uh, or work was mainly in, in the data um, that we collect from studies and where the people require hospitalization, but as well, the people that they don't have to be in the ho hospitals or you know they, they pass the cover like mild to moderate, there are uh, 10 most common um, symptoms in all the, 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 the participants on this study that was published in, in analytical, analytical, clinical, rational, neurology, and most of them as well, there are neurological symptoms and with high percentage, similar to the, the people that they require hospitalization, for example, head or, or disorder or lo, uh, loss of taste or smell, um, pain, uh, et cetera, even tinnitus that are related with um, lack of audition, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, most of the symptoms that are really uh, problematic to, to have a good quality of life and, and we go to over time, for example, these symptoms, they, they appear like in the first months after um, the infection, but what happened one year after? And this paper coming out, published in the last summer, and, and showed that uh, a half of the patients, they, they have a less one symptom. So um, after our percentage, there were 80% of the patients who have that 50%, so the percentage were reduced over time. And, and the most common there are the fatigue and the and the muscle weakness that represented 20% of the cases. So all these ratios in, in percentage and the prevalence of the symptoms over time, they were reduced. So that is some point that, that good news so far. And, and, and also the, all these symptoms depend on the immune system. And as you know, the, the, the kids they have, um, they are less affected by COVID-19 and, the, and one of the major uh, reasons is the is the local systemic response in in kids and adolescents is different that happen in adults. There are different parameters that I'm not going to to go here. But for example, there are a, a strong maturation patterns that are different in, in the child and the adults. There are the the systemic innate interferon uh, play an important role in all the cascade of the the um, cytokines in, in immune cells that they are different. So the kids in the they are uh, in some way protected against COVID-19 in the acute phase. But what happened with the long COVID kids? So we did the same meta-analysis. Uh, this, this work we, I submitted the last night, so we'll be in preparing in the next hours, or even maybe over the weekend. So 
the long COVID and kids is related as well. The, the, the prevalence of the pediatric COVID, long COVID is much less than in adults, but is real. So the pediatric long COVID um, uh, has the major symptoms that are neuropsychiatric. They are related with the fatigue, cognitive problems, um, irritability, um, sleep disorders, and etc. So they are associated with the severity of the disease or the acute phase of the, of the COVID-19. And then uh, also there are uh, symptoms that are diagnostic in, in kids that they uh, suffer, they, 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 they have the infection like a mild COVID or even asymptomatic COVID. So that is a, a percentage, you keep this number here in mind, 25% of the, of the, of the uh, COVID positive cases in, in pediatric cases, they develop in some symptom after the infection even if they have a, a, a mild COVID um, acute um, disease. So that is, an, uh, that is not alarming, but it's a, it's a reality. Some of the people they have, they, they say that, they, you know, that they, some doctor clinicians, they say that will be not that relevant to kids, but we, we saw that they, even after the, the, um, the severe uh, COVID, they can develop serious problems, months or even. Uh, years after. So we compare, for example, the neurological problems in adults and kids, the percentage of the values is, is lower in kids, but there are some uh, really detrimental um, fats like uh, the, the mood symptoms or, or irritability disorders that is so uh, difficult to associate that with the COVID disease because, uh, of course, there are um, kids and they have uh, all these issues related with the pandemic. So it's, it's very um, the, the schools they were closed. They have socializing problems. It's, it's, it's quite a challenge to determine if these um, long-term effects that are related to the um, SARS-CoV-2 infection or that are uh, a product of the of the pandemic. And, and as well, because most of the studies they don't um, did the diagnostic, the right diagnostic to the in children. They didn't get a, a PCR or antigen test previous to the to the um, diagnostic of the long COVID. So um, we need to keep exploring more uh, better diagnostic of all these, uh, all these symptoms and, and determine if they, they are associated with the long COVID disease or not. And another major question is the why woman? Why, why does the long COVID affect more women than men? And, and we know that there are, um, uh, it's not only the hormonal system that, that is different, but there are several factors, like for example, the woman they have a genetic predisposition uh, to developing autoimmunity, so to, to generate these autoantibodies that they are one of the sources of the uh, long COVID. Uh, we found as well that the women they have um, more olfactory damage, so the, the, the anosmia is a symptom that is associated to develop the uh, neuro long COVID. Um, the men, for example, they have a predisposition for a, a strong um, inflammatory response in the acute phase, but uh, in also you know, and the cytokine, the cytokine strong is, is more relevant in them than in women. In another factor, for example, the, uh, the immunoregulatory functions that are, they differ in women and men. Even the percentage that are not astronomic, that means there are, of course, there are men that develop long COVID, but the, the, the ratio uh, differs um, according with the, all these parameters that we need to keep identifying and find more factors that are related to that. So we know more things, for example, about the pathophysiology of the long COVID. Um, mailing occurs because there's a uh, systemic chronic inflammation. And that, uh, that um, can occur after a, a severe COVID, but as well after my COVID. So um, the other reason of this inflammation maybe is because the part of this virus, they were not clean from the body, from the system and they are periodically um, getting activated and causing this local inflammation. There are genetic factors that they can predispose someone to development uh, long COVID or not. And also we know that, that there are generating these microclots formation in, in some parts of some organ in, in as well the autoimmune reaction and the, generate, the generation of the, these autoantibodies is quite relevant. In another factor that curiously is, is in common, some factor is common with the uh, chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia, that is the 
uh, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction. So that is, is a key uh, component to determine our biomarkers for long COVID and, and analyze all these um, factors that can induce this mitochondrial dysfunction in, in individual organs because this, this, the long COVID is a multi-organ complications they going through the uh, liver, spleen, brain, and et cetera, et cetera. Meaning is related as well with the uh, percentage, the, the AC2 receptor uh, that is expressed in, in each particular uh, organ. So who we can determine if someone is developing long COVID or not, the first diagnostic is the blood test uh, and to look at the profile of the cytokines that are associated with the long COVID. That is determined already, and we know that there are several of them that the pro-inflammatory cytokines that also were present in the acute phase as can be like interleukin-1 uh, beta or interleukin-6, uh, uh, et cetera. So there are uh, indicators that we are developing or we, are, um, we have high risk to develop more uh, severe symptoms of long COVID, and as well the, the general inflammatory markers. Um, related with all the all the inflammatory uh, compounds uh, like can be the, the ferritin, the cortisol, or or even measure the, the levels of vitamins. So um, the the immunopathology of the severe COVID uh, after all this inflammation or systems is um, is is following the course of the late the, the, the interferon response. Mostly that is the interferon levels that are crucial to eliminate. Uh, the, the viral persistent in our, in our body. When this thing doesn't occur, so the, the virus um, can attack the, the vessels and the, and the, through the, you know, the, all the, the, the immune system can be activated and monocytes and macrophages and all these inflammatory cells can cause the systemic inflammation and can uh, accumulate in the vessels and, and cause uh, uh, serious vascular damage and, and tissue damage. That is the, the source of the pathogenic inflammation that occurs in the COVID, long COVID patients. So that is it's really important to uh, understand all this uh, process, but definitely they are modulated for this by this chronic uh, and pathogenic, pathogenic inflammation. So we know that this thing occurs mainly in the people that they suffer the severe COVID, but as well in asymptomatic and microbi, and, and we don't know exactly uh, which factors that are more or less um, um, drivers or the, or the long COVID pathophysiology. But for example, if we think of the, the autoimmunity, autoimmunity, some people, they have a genetic predisposition for, to suffer, um, to generate these autoantibodies that attacks their own tissue. And also another component that, another hypothesis that they, they, is, is determined of that, is the uh, microbiome, so that the, the, the dysbiosis in this bacteria that change um, after infection can be a, a driver or the, or the brain gut connection and can cause some of the neurological symptoms in post-COVID. And we have, uh, as I mentioned before, the, tissue, the vascular damage and the, and the tissue damage that cause the, the chronic inflammation. And, and as well, the hypothesis related with the viral reservoir that there are these particles than the this virus that there are causing local inflammation through the different tissues. So all these hypotheses, maybe uh, one is the driver of hypothesis in, in one uh, specific individual, but can be the four of them at the same time. So can can be the the, the cause of the sources of the post-acute uh, sequel the SARS-CoV-2 and, and can be really detrimental even um, months and years after. And, and we saw that, for example, one year after recovery from, uh, from the acute phase of the COVID, uh, a lot of patients, a percentage, significant percentage of patients, they have increased risk to developing uh, cardiovascular problems and, and disease. And some of them that are including, for example, the heart arrhythmia, um, the heart muscle inflammation, blood clots, and, and even strokes, um, myocardial infarctions, or, or heart. Um, problems that there are quite severe and in, in, in can, can be one of the consequences of the, the infection. And, and the most, um, you know, the, the impact of this information is that you know, that can occur in people that they, they didn't require hospitalization. So we need to be alert to every, every single uh, symptom and definitely uh, a following up uh, after, um, after COVID infection will be very 
important to the, to determine to to write uh, to find out the, the the right diagnostic for all these diseases associated with the long COVID. So who we can you know determine that there are these there are a, a, a prediction model or which people person individual has more chance to develop all these problems or what kind of the the checking um, clinical parameters we need to evaluate. So we know some something, for example, related with the with the prediction model. We know that the, during the primary infection or the or the acute phase, there are five symptoms that are quite critical um, to to increase the risk to develop long COVID. Um, there are uh, fever, fatigue, cough, dyspnea, or gastrointestinal symptoms. They they were found that these symptoms they were um, the people that they they show these symptoms in the initial phase they have high risk to develop long COVID. As well, another parameter that is the immunoglobulin signature. This is total uh, the clinical uh, you know the, the parameters of the immunoglobulin M and the immunoglobulin G, G3. Etc. Well, there are factors that they could people they could measure to determine that. In all that, there are related to the age, uh, clinical history, and of course the they suffer asthma as well. But another uh, measurement that we can determine can determine that is, for example, the presence of the autoantibodies, the concentration of the autoantibodies that the people produce. They can be determined as well to develop a long COVID. Uh, if they have as well the, the persistent type 2 diabetes or the um, SARS CoV 2 uh, RNA, this reservoir uh, on the system. And curiously, it was, um, was fine that, the, for example, this, the, the ACE bar virus can be um, activated um, by after the SARS CoV 2 infection. And is the, the ACE bar virus the, the one that can induce the local inflammation, chronic inflammation? That could be the the the, the cause of the, the some of the symptoms of long COVID, and uh, so that is really important to determine if this uh, you know these patients um, they they need uh, be treated by antiviral to reduce the long COVID symptoms or another or another treatment. So it's, it's really important to to recognize what they have in the system and and to to apply the the right treatment. And another thing that is surprising that, they, for example, even the people that they, they have loss of the smell, that is happening um, mostly with the another variant, for example, with Delta in, in previous variants, it was more relevant that, for example, that with um, compared to Omicron, for example, right? So the loss of smell was really the, uh, a good predictor of the, of the long COVID symptoms, neuro, neurological symptoms specifically. Uh, for example, a better predictor than the severity of the uh, acute phase of the disease. So that is important to recognize as well. And, and, the, and the, another um, thing that was recently discovered that is the, the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve gets affected, the periphery uh, central and as well the periphery system, uh, nervous system was affected after the, the acute phase, but as well is a, is a symptom of the long COVID. So the pathophysiological problems that in the symptoms that there are uh, associated with the long COVID uh, have um, um, a pathological um, damage in the vagus nerve in the 16.6% of the patients. And, and curiously, the 91% of them, they were women. So it's, uh, um, that is, uh, that is, this, this, these numbers, this percentage, they can, from the first study that will be presented in the European Congress of Clinical Microbiology in the next following weeks, there are no published yet, but the, it's something that we have to take uh, in consideration that pro probably the, the new treatments could be focused in brain stimulation or even vagus nerve stimulation to induce um, you know, some kind of the recovery from all these um, long COVID symptoms associated. It can be, for example, the trouble of the sagging or, or, or the breathing problems with the breathing. So all these detrimental symptoms could be uh, targeting, applying um, brain or vagus nerve stimulation. So in another um, kind of the, the pathology, the gastrointestinal symptoms that curiously in the acute phase appears early on after the infection, even before that the respiratory problems, and, but can persist in the uh, vomits or diarrhea, et cetera, um, in the patients over months. And, and you, this was the, the one paper that was 
published in the 2020. In, in, in green, you can see here that the, the SARS-CoV-2 um, was um, attached to the epithelia or the intestinal epithelia in, in even months uh, after, after the infection. So we know that the, the people that they, they were infected uh, by uh, SARS-CoV-2, 16% of them, they have intestinal problems. So um, in this reservoir, viral reservoir is still there in the intestine. And that is something really important. It's one of the, the, the projects that we are uh, studying in my lab, and we are looking at the connection of these um, microbiome changes and this intestinal inflammation that the SARS-CoV-2 can induce in, in the relation with neurological problems. So we know that there are the brain, uh, lungs, gut microbiome axis in, in, in the acute phase of the disease is quite important. And there are um, uh, a relation with the severity of the injury. So there are specific bacteria that are associated with the, with the severity of the acute phase. But now we are trying to um, investigate this uh, correlation is, is uh, associated as well with the symptomatology of the long COVID. So we are trying to... Uh, identify specific bacteria, and that as well could be a, a, a good chance for um, address uh, specific treatments to restore the microbiome uh, for a, a better recovery from long COVID. So there are uh, too many publications working on this, on this, um, on this brain gut, gut axis, and specifically for the gut microbiome. It would hope to to publish our work as well soon. And the last part of my talk, I would like to. Um, since that I'm a neurologist and neuroscientist, and I would like to talk about the, this, this, this amazing uh, thing that is, the, the virus can affect to the, to the brain and these neurological manifestations that we are uh, seeing the, in the COVID patients um, is, is, is really important. It's more um, a long-term effect that they, even that the respiratory problems. We know that at least a half of the patients, they have some neurological problem, even hair or or, or loss of um, uh, brain fog, or et cetera. There are uh, multiple neurological problems associated. And in the, in the, in the um, early on, in the, in the acute phase, we saw a high percentage of patients that they suffer stroke or cardiovascular problems after the infection. And over time, we know that the, the, this virus can cause a long-term uh, medical consequence that could be associated with the neurodegenerative disease. So um, there are multiple uh, neurological, neuropsychiatric symptoms. I'm not going to go through all them, but in blue, uh, in, the, in, the, in the boxes in blue, you can see that there are, for example, seizures, ataxia, head, uh, anxiety, depression, all these symptoms uh, that are associated to the, and that occurs during the acute phase in the first four weeks after the infection. But some of these symptoms that are translated to the uh, long COVID and, and post-acute sequel of the, of the SARS-CoV-2 infection. And, and I can uh, highlight, for example, the post-traumatic stress disorder, um, uh, continuous seizures, sleep disorders, um, fatigue and memory deficits. Uh, you know, there are really debilitating some of the symptoms. For example, some people, they have this attention deficit disorder. They, they, even they cannot read a, a book or a, or a page or they cannot holding like a couple meetings uh, at work. So it's, it's really debilitating and, and, and we need to pay attention to all that and treat it as well as we can. So why this thing occurs? Why the brain gets affected by a, a respiratory disease? So there are uh, several uh, pathways that the virus can, can affect to the brain. There are a direct viral entry into the, into the olfactory bulbs and there are the immune response that can targeting um, the brain by secondary inflammation and, and, and then the cytokines can affect the vessels in the brain and they can um, produce this neuroinflammatory uh, cascade in, um, in, in specific areas that uh, can cause these non-specific symptoms uh, also related uh, with, the, with the disease. So the, the first step is like when you when we have this uh, some of the patients, they have this uh, loss of the smell is because the epithelium uh, is getting inflammated. So the respiratory epithelium uh, can uh, get inflammated and this inflammation can uh, damage the cells that can uh, uh, be in touch with the olfactory bulb. And we are talking about that. We are 
talking about the central nervous system in as well the, as the brain. So when the, this uh, um, uh, blood circulation and the virus also can circulate through the um, micro vessels that there are in the brain, as well, we have another root entry and we can get a blood barrier and um, um, break down in, in this disruption that they can make that the virus directly uh, can penetrate into parenchyma. And when this thing happens, can damage the, the neurons directly, right? So we can get like a neuronal loss, and, but as well mainly is because they can activate the, the glial cells, that there are the inflammatory cells in the brain, and, and these cells can produce neuroinflammatory um, compounds and cytokines that definitely can, can kill the neurons and can cause uh, permanent damage or, or, or a chronic inflammation in specific areas in the brain. So there are, there are different routes, but the, depending on the many of the route that is more, um, some people get more affected or not, can cause different symptoms. Uh, for example, the, the loss of taste or smell, and um, we have as well the, 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 the virus can cause this stroke that will be more uh, like severe consequence. And there are, it's, it's weird that happen, but can happen specifically, in the, especially in the acute phase. And we have symptoms that are more um, strange, like the, the William Barra syndrome or encephalitis, et cetera, et cetera. And, and another symptom that uh, is associated is the lack of myelin, that is this um, protein that, um, in, that is around the, the neurons. So it can be really long-term um, de uh, detrimental and in, in, in can aggravate uh, neurological disease. So uh, in 2020, so in the, in the lab of the Akiko Yukasaki in, from the University of Yale, they, they published um, this amazing um, paper showing that who the SARS-CoV-2, the spike protein, was attached to the neurons. This is the it's a immunostochemistry from a, a post-mortem tissue, a patient that um, died after uh, severe COVID. And that was quite shocking because we see that the, you know, the, the neurons, they could, um, that we know that they have a low concentration of AC2 receptors, but even they were attacked by the, by the virus. And, and not only the, the invasion of the SARS-CoV-2 was were in the neurons as well in the meninges and in, the, in, in general in the vascular system, in the cerebral vascular system. So this, this can cause a chronic inflammation that was pulled by others um, over these couple of years. And we know that the, um, the, this neurological uh, and, and neuroinflammation um, can induce the, 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 the amyloid precursors um, proteins in the brain can break down and they can um, in, increase the chance to, to develop this amyloid beta and this amyloid beta in the brain uh, can be really detrimental and can produce the plaques. And we don't know that this paper, for example, was published in 2018, but well, this is like um, some kind of the description, not only in, in Alzheimer's disease, but in, in other pathologies, even in after uh, brain trauma, or, or a stroke that we know that there are, um, uh, and the neuroinflammation can cause uh, this uh, uh, chronic uh, inflammation that can induce the, the neurodegenerative um, formation of the plaques in the brain. So um, several um, groups that are, they were start to study that what happened with the COVID patients, um, if they have uh, during the acute phase or even uh, long term, they have this chronic inflammation in the brain. And the question remains is that that will induce a long-term increase of neurogenitive disease. And, and probably, yes, we don't know. We are a little bit far from to provide an answer to that because we need to wait a, a few years. But for example, uh, already um, was uh, uh, published some, some case reports. And for example, this one was in a woman that's 58 years old. So that was quite young in, in to develop in these plaques and this accumulation of amyloid beta deposits in the brain and after um, the COVID uh, infection. So that is a, a, a weird case, but we, we need to think about what will happen in the, in the future if we really need to start to um, look at the people that they, they suffer the severe COVID if they develop some of these plaques and maybe we need to start to administrate anti-amyloid um, 
peptides uh, against um, this this compound, right, to the, to reduce the long term consequence to development in dementia or, or Alzheimer's disease. And and Dr. Peter Otter this morning, and um, he showed in his presentation this amazing work that we saw um, in preprint in the last uh, August, I believe, and now it was published in Nature. This amazing work uh, following up the study um, and uh, showing different. Um, uh, around 400 patients and, and different measurements in the brain um, uh, from this um, biobank in the University of Oxford. So they following up, they have the previous uh, brain scanners of these people and they, um, they did um, a correlated study with the people that they, they suffered uh, my COVID or even uh, severe COVID or moderate COVID. And they, they found basically that there are a, a loss of the gray matter. And, and they found as well uh, tissue damage. So uh, that could be quite, uh, uh, will be a, a alarming study, but we don't know exactly the clinical consequence of that. We need to wait a little bit more and, 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 and see what happened because we, we don't, they didn't um, find any um, uh, cognitive test, for example, that they, they, these patients, they will perform worse that the, that the patient they were not infected, or for example, they, there are no like a, a, a straight uh, correlation between the long-term sin symptoms and, and this um, volumetric change on the on the specific areas of the brain. So clinically, we don't know what kind of the relevance we have this world, but definitely we need something that um, we need to follow up this, this studies and, and, and to, to get a better interpretation why that means in, 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 in this change in specific regions in the, in the volume. Of the, of the brain. And what we, if we know that so far uh, after two years of pandemic, what we learned from the previous coronavirus, for example, uh, regarding to the long consequence. So, of course, we cannot compare. Uh, we cannot compare the SARS in 2003 or the MERS in 2012. And, and the people that get infected was, was minimal. And, and we cannot have any, you know, um, any possible comparison what happened with the COVID-19 and um, COVID-19 with the other coronavirus. But for example, uh, we know that there are, uh, they were by then a, a reducing in physical capacity that, until six months. So definitely were, were long um, coronavirus symptoms. Um, once one or three uh, of these patients, they suffer post-traumatic stress disorders. Um, they, they were observed even two years after uh, pulmonary fibrosis on these patients and, and problems with uh, hypercorticals, corticalism, and, and then definitely they, some of them, they, they show long-term disabilities. Um, the other study that was the, the long-term following up study that after four years after uh, SARS-1 uh, uh, was this, this paper that show, was published like 12 years ago, that they showed them that the mostly of the physical conditions of these patients they have after one year were improved. So basically they recovery most of the symptoms uh, after one year, right? And this is the, and the, good, uh, the good news, but uh, the mental conditions or maybe the neurological and neuropsychiatric uh, conditions that they develop, uh, even they show uh, limited signs of improvement four years after. So there are definitely a, a psychiatric and, and morbidity and, and chronic fatigue that they, most of the patients they didn't recover and they they when they they keep doing uh, rehabilitation and other um, um, symptomatologic and, and other clinical management manager of that. Well, and this is a this is a article in Spanish that they they were in an interview uh, regarding to what will happen in the future, right? And and, and I say that. To me, as so far, the thing that the data I have um, so far, basically, uh, for the long COVID, uh, we have to be worried about the neurological and neuropsychiatric symptoms that will persist over the over the years. Right? So, what we in the last couple of slides, I want to show that what we have as the treatment. Um, basically, there are no specific treatment for long COVID. We need to um, uh, take care about every single symptom individually and. And some of the symptoms or sequelas that are treated in the same way as other symptoms, like that, without COVID, well, without post-COVID, right? You have some problem, you need to go to the um, uh, 
specialists and, and, and treated in the, independently. So um, we have to take care about the, you know, the uh, increase the post COVID units in the hospitals with, uh, you know, there are uh, following up studies on, uh, on these patients with the pulmonary rehabilitation, cardiac and musculoskeletal, uh, psychological, following up neurological, um, exercise, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, the nutrition as well is really important to recovery, et cetera. But there are some guidelines, right? So the, there are uh, overview of, the, of this uh, manage, managing of the long COVID effects. And that could starting, of course, with the diagnostic, a positive test by antigen test or PTCR, uh, identifying the long COVID symptoms correctly if they are associated with the long COVID disease. Um, there are um, some studies to do a clinical review after four weeks and, and determine which person has long COVID or not. Uh, there are uh, a following up study of the clinical history and then the appropriate, appropriate examinations, blood tests, etc. We need to generate a planning care that's meaning the level of the support for these patients and, and manage it, the, the right pathway for each individual. And, and it's uh, definitely that is a multidisciplinary rehabilitation um, effort, uh, self managing and, and supported. Uh, uh, support as well, you know, the, the high risk groups of the population can be the older people and children. They need a specific uh, clinical management. And then, the, of course, the following up and, and mon monitoring every single symptom, um, sharing information like globally and, and to the community and, and, and it, to identify the right biomarkers for the best diagnostic and, and organize the service organization that may provide access to the multidisciplinary service for accessing to the physical and mental health and for the carry out and you know the in the future test all the all the uh, clinical matching all, all that so in general the, the post covid recovery program has to be involved with the uh, regarding to the patient needs and, and the doctors that they have to be involved with according with the specific symptomatology uh, and, and definitely now more than ever we need to create the, the, the personalized medicine because every single patient that suffers long COVID has a, a, a so individual symptomatology and problems that definitely we need to care about. You know, there are no like a regular problem for all them. So it's, it's quite individualized and, and now more than ever, we need to do the, uh, establish a personalized medicine for them, for the proper evaluation and intervention. So there are critical and, and that is because we need to minimize and the, the effect of the of these uh, long COVID uh, symptoms and long term, and, and avoid to, that they develop in different conditions. And, and we don't know exactly the, the percentage of people that they will get long COVID. Some 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 uh, scientists they are talking about one ten percent of the population, but if, even if it's you know ten percent, uh, we are in front of the one hundred thirty many of the cases for life of the hunting that people that they they have these disability in conditions so definitely is going to be a huge uh, uh, major public um, health problem the nh is investing a lot of money to provide uh, uh, you know to, to give some answers to all these questions about the spectrum of the recovery how many people can be affected uh, the the biological uh, cause of these infections, why some people get infected, what, uh, get uh, long COVID and why other people not, and, and the risk to, to development of other detrimental conditions or, 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 or another disease, of course. So uh, yeah, and with that, uh, thank you so much. I, I don't have more slides to share, but mm -hmm. you have some questions I'll be happy to, to answer. Yeah, let me get to the questions because we're running out of time and you have quite a few. Um, I first, is there any evidence showing that long COVID symptoms are related to the different variants that Alpha, Delta, Omicron have different effects to long COVID? Yeah, the thing that we know is that all the variants uh, in, in, in can cause long COVID. Uh, there are some variants that it's kind of, it's, it's so early to determine the specific for the Omicron, but apparently the Omicron could cause, can cause as well long COVID, but can cause less neurological symptoms because there are less uh, loss of smell um, uh, affectation in the acute phase. So probably uh, that is a little bit uh, 
unexplored so far. It's, it's too early to say, but uh, yeah, we, we know that all of them they can cause the Even the people that get vaccinated, they have uh, a lower rate of percentage to get the long COVID, but as well, right? So that is, is, is uh, a major incognito. Apparently, uh, Omicron doesn't cause that much uh, uh, neurological problems that the other variants, as Delta, for example. I thought this was an interesting question. Um, okay, as for like other respiratory you know, ex- respiratory viruses like influenza, have you ever heard of the long flu? Like yes. it, it's, yeah. Yes, so uh, the I have one slide. I don't, I'm not going to give the, the, uh, the percentage because I don't want to do wrong numbers, but it was kind of lower in some of the long COVID uh, uh, the rate of the long COVID is a little bit higher uh, and some of the symptoms, the same that the uh, long flu symptoms, but of course we are getting vaccinated with all the flu every year, right? We have a certain immunity, and, but there are specific symptoms that there are, uh, there are common, uh, the flu and the COVID, and some people and that they, they pass the, the flu, they have uh, lo- these long uh, flu symptoms as well. Uh, uh, we cannot compare, I say, right, because, you know, we just get the, the most of the symptoms that with long COVID, um, they are not the same that we share with the flu, but some of them, yes. And the ratio uh, is a little bit higher in the COVID, but not that much. So yes, as that other, other virus, they are associated with uh, okay. long symptoms. So basically that says if we can understand long COVID better, we could probably treat lots of things better. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. A lot of a lot of patients with uh, chronic fatigue, etc., might uh, they're going yeah. to be uh, improving the, the quality of life. Um, uh, yeah, when we know more about long COVID, finally. I know we're, we're so far from fully understanding long COVID, but like when you think of a, a more permanent treatment or cure, even it's like, are we looking at a cell therapy? Is it a drug? Is it an antibody? Is you mentioned the microbiome? I mean, what does your gut tell you? Yeah, all them in, in ice. I see here in the last a couple of slides. So it's, it's, I feel that it's quite important the, the personalized medicine right now do a, like a better diagnostic with all the biomarkers possible. What happened? What is the source of the? Which is the you know the reason that why some specific individual is developing long COVID? And, and after that, when we have this information, we can apply specific treatments. Maybe some people they need antiviral because they have the, the source of the long COVID, is this viral reservoir, or maybe because they have autoimmunity and they need uh, another specific treatments. Maybe they have uh, a systemic inflammation or, uh, or, or a microbiome dysbiosis. So they need to restore the microbiome and maybe with a specific probiotics for, for that. So that, that is, a, is, a, is a challenge. And I know that there are a lot of people desesperate with that they have suffered for over one year long COVID and they are trying to do all the tests and all the analysis, try to find out why, right? Why they are like that. And, and that is quite frustrating, but as well can provide the answer why you need to, to, to treat your problems, right? So you have some dysfunction, mitochondrial dysfunction. I know that there are a study in, in UK, um, uh, one, one specific study uh, to, to target the mit- mitochondrial dysfunction on these patients. So if there are a, a, a treatment, a drug for, for this um, patient, that would be uh, wonderful, right? So that there are too many studies running out right now and, and we'll get more answers very soon. Well, Sonia, thank you so much. I, I wish we had more time. Uh, Todd, I'm going to bring you back up. Thanks, Angela. Um, yeah, and great, fabulous talk there. And I really just want to give a round of applause to all of our speakers here today. Um, all six talks were just wonderful. Um, really, really fascinating day. I, I'll wrap things up as as we are up on time here. And thank you, Angela, for co-moderating the second half. So yeah, I just very briefly share my screen. Just uh, two things quickly to share here. Um, so once again, I'd like to share, uh, thank the K2I administrative staff, Michelle Atkinson and Mackenzie. Thank you both for, so much for your help getting making this event a reality and, and all of the hard work that went in behind the scenes and during the event to make it a success. Um, I would like to thank my colleague, Angela Wilkins, for co-moderating the um, symposium today. It was, it was really uh, 
uh, and exciting and kind of interesting and informative to hear all of the great research, the talks, and, and it kind of really, really, really came together wonderfully. So thank you, Angela. Um, I would like to, to thank my lab members, Nick, uh, Mike, Kristen, and Yunchi for helping uh, moderate questions and, and help organize things again. Um, and yeah, just last but not least, of course, all of the speakers, the wonderful set of speakers again. I mean, just, just across the board, excellent talks covering a wide range of, of topics here. And just to conclude very briefly, uh, just a very summary, uh, very happy to share that, you know, we had really good attendance today. I understand there's a lot of Zoom related fatigue and, and it's a Friday after all, but very excited to see if we had great attendance. We, uh, topics covered span vaccines to transmission to wastewater monitoring and long COVID as we just heard. Um, and we, we answered over 25 questions live and, and received many more than that. And apologies to all of those that we were able to answer your question live. And, and with that, I would just say as concluding remark, um, again, Angela and I would just like to say that, you know, just kind of the primary goal is to express gratitude for all of the, 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 the first responders, public health officials, doctors, nurses, medical staff, scientists across the globe who have worked tirelessly over the last two years on this two-year anniversary of the declaration, uh, WHO declaration of the pandemic. So I just really wanted to say thank you to all of you for, for everything you've done over the last two years. And then once again, thank all of our invited speakers for making time uh, in their busy schedules to share their exciting research with, with, with all of us. And with that, Angela, I don't know if you have any concluding remarks or comments, but with that, we, we, can, we can adjourn. All right, thanks everyone.